Okay, it is 7.35 p.m. on Wednesday, October 20th, 2021. Um, good evening, my name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, calling this meeting of the board to order. I'd like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present uh, from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Putting on his headset. Good evening, Patrick. Um, Kevin Mills. Here. Sean O'Rourke. Here. Aaron Ford. Good evening, here. Good evening. And Stephen Revelack. Here. Good evening, all, one and all. Uh, for the town, I know Mr. Uh, Mr. Alarelli is tied up in another meeting, but he'll be joining us. Um, uh, Vincent Lee is here, though. Here. Then he could see you and Kelly Linema, the town's new assistant director of the Department of Planning and Community Development, is here as well. Yeah. Good to see you. Um, consultants for the board, uh, Paul Haverty. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Good to see you. And from uh, Beta Group, we have uh, Marty Nover is here and Tyler Durner is here. Good evening. Good evening to you both. Hi, good evening. And appearing um, on behalf of Thorndike Place, uh, Stephanie Kiefer is here. Good evening, Stephanie. Good evening. And um, joining you, it appears, is most of the team who we've been getting yes. to know well over these past few years. So we have, um, just quickly, we have um, Art uh, Clipfell and Gwen Noyes from Oak Tree. Uh, we have our project engineer, John Hessian. We have, um, from Vanessa, we have both this evening, Derek Roach and Scott Thornton. Um, our housing consultant, Bob Angler, is on board. And I believe that Scott Glassock, our architect, is also here, but I'm not seeing him on my screen. Um, maybe he's not joined on yet. But Scott is in a car. Uh, this is Arthur talking. And uh, if we need him, he, he is on call. He can show anything after 8.30 that anyone would like to see. It was his message to me. After 8.30. But he's listening. <laughs> Welcome one and all. <clears throat> So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency signed into law on June 16th, 2021. This act includes an extension until April 1st, 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law which suspended the requirement to hold all public meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed to continue to participate remotely. Public bodies may continue to meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom app with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Other participants are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials mm -hmm. that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. As chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. That is not an issue this evening as we have only one item on our agenda. That brings up item two, which is Thorndike Place. Um, now turning, returning to the comprehensive permit hearing for Thorndike Place. 
for likely the last time. At the prior hearing on October 5th, 2021, the board reviewed the draft decision, including findings, conditions, and waiver requests as prepared by the board's consultants. We heard from the applicant and members of the public, both in regards to the draft decision and regarding the project in general. Several people raised concerns that the version of the draft decision posted to the board's website included many track changes, making the draft difficult to follow and understand. It was requested that a cleaned up version of the draft be prepared and posted for review. The time period for closing the public hearing was set to expire on October 8th. That would not leave sufficient time to reissue the draft and hold a hearing before the public hearing period ended. The board negotiated with the applicant for additional time to prepare and review a cleaned draft. After reviewing possible dates with the applicant and consultants, it was agreed to continue the public hearing to today, Wednesday, October 20th, and extend the public hearing period to Thursday, October 21st. The board voted to approve both of those dates. The clean draft was prepared by the board and posted to the board's website on October 13th. Additional comments received by the board have been posted to tonight's agenda and or to the board's website. The plan for tonight's hearing is to review any outstanding questions regarding the draft decision. After the conclusion of this discussion, the board will take public comment. Thereafter, the board will vote on closing the public hearing. During the public comment period this evening, the board will only take comments related to specific items in the draft decision. The board has been impressed by the compassion and concern expressed by the public in regards to the, this project over the last five years. The discussion has been thought provoking, informed, and sometimes quite heated. Please know that we have heard you and we are well aware of your concerns and we understand the uncertainty you feel with regards to this project. We have heard you loud and clear. However, the board is now at the point where we need to close the public hearing as is required by the state regulations governing the conduct of a comprehensive permit hearing. For this reason, I'm asking to limit public comment to only those items that are in the draft decision or are missing from the draft decision. Please try to refrain from concerns about the project in general or issues unrelated to the draft decision. So turning to the draft decision, are there any questions from members of the board. And what are we still looking for clarification on? Mr. Revlap. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, I, I basically just have one question um, you know, that's, that's still outstanding to me. In the finding section, there are paragraphs 64B and 65A. Both uh, of these paragraphs contain the language proposed condition to be inserted at the appropriate place. So in the case of 65A, I believe this, the appropriate conditions appear in, sec in C1E. And I think the corresponding one for 64B is in C1D. And I just would like to, um, you know, if beta or town staff has any um, feel, you know, if they agree or disagree with that. Basically, I, I'm looking, you know, to see if they have any advice on, um, you know, whether those, you know, proposed to be inserted are, you know, you know, relatively taken care of in C1D and C1E, or if there, some merging will be necessary. That is my question, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, 64B, 64A and uh, 64B and 65A. That is correct. Forward, zip up to that. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. This is Pat. Um, I had the privilege of trying to put together the factual statements for the cleaned up or quasi cleaned up um, uh, uh, thing. Originally, if the board may remember and the public may remember in the previous draft, there was a finding which in effect included these as a condition. Uh, because we did this without uh, those of us who were involved in the cleanup effort, couldn't, con couldn't coordinate with one another. Um, when I tried to put this into a form where there was a finding here and a, con a condition envisioned later on, um, I was not able to know exactly where that would go. 
Um, and so I left the substance of what was previously there uh, in sort of conditioned format with the thought that it could be placed uh, somewhere else. Since then, in reviewing the decision, I've noticed that there's an overlap with some other places, as Mr. Revelak has pointed out. Um, and I can just say that that because of the open meeting law restrictions on putting this together, uh, there hasn't been an opportunity to, or was not an opportunity to compare the language between those two sections. And uh, having said that, I think I've given Beta time to look it up and, and answer whether or not uh, they're right. I, I had the impression that what was in the draft, which came from Beta and the ACC, was to the extent to which it was different, uh, uh, somewhat improved over the draft that was previously in the findings. Anything further, Mr. Revelak? Uh, nothing further, Mr. Chair. But Mr. Chairman, let me just say that that what I said didn't really answer the question whether there was any merging to be done. I don't. I don't know if. <laughs> If people are, if beta is, and our the, the experts are are up on the language enough to make that comparison, at at the moment, <laughs> but all I had to say is that in effect that effort has not yet been made because of the way we split up the task. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, um, you know, I this is I mean, it's a it's a it's a big question for, to to be answered, you know, just off the off the cuff. Um, but if it's possible to, you know, get an opinion uh, at some point during the night, uh, particularly with finding 64B and condition C1D, um, I, I think that would be will be uh, helpful as we uh, go into deliberations. And certainly, if uh, we also submitted into the record prior to this was um, a draft decision as marked up by. Uh, by beta group. So we do have a set of comments um, from them on the, the prior draft decision. Um, so if the if those comments are included in there, um, that's great. If not, um, if Ms. Nover could uh, provide a little guidance before the end of the evening, that would be that would be great. Yes, Mr. Chair, um, Marty Nova with the beta group. I'm gonna have to look um, and, and compare the two. Um, this is really, I just got, into the into the office and I'm looking at the clean version. So I'm gonna to have to compare. So I can do that now. That would be great. Thank you. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Members of the board who have questions on the draft. Ads. Um, so I had tried to to read through um, all my notes that I've been taking over the last year on this project and see if there were anything that were um, still outstanding questions. Um, so we, um, we have submitted into the record a landscape plan for the development parcel, but we do not have uh, detailed plans for the conservation parcel on anything. Um, so that is just known. Um, uh, there's a number of questions that came up over the course of the hearing in regard that are sort of construction related, um, both in, you know, in terms of vehicle access, in terms of parking of construction vehicles, um, hours of operation, police um, and flaggers, uh, things along those, um, the status of the no heavy trucking notice on Lake Street um, <clears throat> and several other things. So we'll, I think the, the board will have to discuss those when we go into uh, deliberation as to how we want to include um, addressing the, those issues that were raised by the public. Um, at the previous hearing, there was a specific question that was raised. Um, there's a waiver request from the town signed by law. Um, and so the, the board was considering um, conditional 
approval on it. Let's see if I can find it quickly. Uh, so it's this one here, number 21. Um, so the waiver, we were going to allow the applicant, want, the applicant requested one ground sign um, and a canopy sign. And the canopy sign was going to be limited to the size of the face of the proposed canopy. So that was fairly straightforward. Um, I was not sure, um, and I don't know if, if Ms. Kiefer can address this. Um, is there a specific size for the ground sign that you would, you're looking for? Um, yes, we had talked about that. I may have Art weigh in. Um, I can't find my note exactly. I think it was uh, six feet by four feet. Am I, um, for the size of it, am I correct, Art, or for the monument sign? You, were, you yeah. had more uh, idea of that. <laughs> I, did, so I, I, I think we decided that 24, 25 feet square, square feet was would be an adequate size. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, if I may, just to be clear though, because it hasn't been designed, that would be like the face of the sign. So it may be that Correct. it's a little bit off the ground. Yeah, so it's not the height of it. Okay, thank you. No, it's just the sign face. Correct. Um, and then the other question is so that the, um, the current bylaw allows uh, directional signs that are one square foot, which is, we had discussed last time, seemed a little bit small for the kinds of messages that would be required. Um, and I know we had we had discussed possibly making that a foot and a half or making that two square feet. Um, I don't know if you had a specific. I, I would suggest two square feet um, that it, it just allows for appropriate making certain that it's um, wide yeah. enough and, and long enough you know, to, to get that in. And um, because there's a senior population being served, I'm not certain if the font may even be a little bit enlarged. So. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. Um, this is Pat again on E16, which is on page 37 of the consolidated drafts. Um, there's a limitation on the hours of operation or the hours of construction activities. Uh, between eight and six Monday through Friday and between the hours of nine and five on Saturdays, Sundays or legal holidays. And I, I wanted to, it, it did seem odd uh, to be contemplating in a residential area uh, uh, construction on the weekend and legal holidays. And I was wondering where that uh, came from and, and the degree to which there, it's really necessary to do that, particularly with all of the testimony that we have received about how quiet this neighborhood is on Saturdays and Sundays and the sports activities that go on in the street. Um, the notion that that the construction is going to be taking place on the weekend seemed uh, noteworthy to me. And I was wondering if the applicant could uh, compliment, could, to, could comment on how important that was to them. Sure, thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, I, I think that um, I will give you an introductory and then I will allow Art to come in. Um, in terms of continuity of construction, we think that um, allowing the Monday through Friday and then the weekend, it's going to overall shorten the time frame for the construction to advance. Um, and I know that the the town's bylaw have it eight to six Monday through Friday, um, and then with the weekend hours. Um, but I, I'm not certain that there's been any restrictions that have been imposed for other residential projects. I know that this is a larger residential project, but um, you know, it doesn't seem to be the case that there should there should be an exception, um, especially when the the time frame could be condensed for the overall construction period. Um, and and I, I hear your concern that it's a residential neighborhood, um, but it, it also, I think, addresses some of the, if, if one has a, a, a six day, say, um, construction period per week, it's going to enable kind of a continuity of work, um, but also if there were concerns about traffic flows on Lake Street, on the weekdays, allowing, again, a, a longer work week for the construction aspect of it, it will reduce the amount of time that 
that's happening on, on Lake Street. So with that said, um, Art or Gwen, if you want to weigh in in terms of. Well, I think uh, the, the, uh, the one that's most onerous, I think, to uh, our future contractor, we hope will be our future contractor, will be the eight o'clock start. Uh, I think these, you know, the, the workers love to start at 730 and uh, no noise before that. We've had that, uh, that limitation in Newton that uh, we start at 730, but uh, no noise until that time. And then they, they, they like to leave, uh, you know, the job at four or something like that and be able to get home and be with their family. And uh, I'm sure we could do eight as a startup. Uh, obviously, in the winter, working until six gets dangerous. So that's an issue. Uh, I think that the, um, the weekends, uh, maybe we could adjust the time a little bit. I'm not sure nine to five is totally necessary. And maybe Sunday is not necessary. But I think is. You know, Stephanie's saying something that's uh, right on track, and I would just agree with that. We're it's all in a, of our best interest to uh, get in and out as quickly as possible, and it's one of the arguments in favor of modular construction, uh, which we hope will prevail. So I'm, I'm not sure how we leave this. Do we need to commit to something tonight, or do we have a little bit of leeway to to talk about that a bit more and to work it out with the building department? Well, our, uh, it's a little hard to know. I mean, the, when we close the hearing, whatever you, my understanding is that we have to put stoppers in our ears and we are not capable of taking in any new information. So when, so anything that you have to say between, that we can take into consideration has to be given to us before the hearing closes. So the, the hours that are stated here under E16, this is uh, taken straight from uh, Title V of the Arlington Town Bylaws. Um, Correct, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. And I, I, what what Art has just suggested, um, it, it would um, it, it would have to be by way of this hearing as a as a verbal request for a, a, a waiver to um, move the start time at 8 a.m. to move it slightly earlier. Um, I don't know if you'll accept a, a verbal request for a waiver on that. Um, but I, I think to the point that you're, and I'll, I'll submit that we'll, we will ask for a waiver of that if you'll accept a verbal waiver um, to perhaps shift that eight hour time frame from a 7.30 to 5.30, um, just for the board's consideration. I think that one, as Art suggested, it works with kind of typical construction protocols, but then secondly, as just as I stated before, um, in terms of it, if there's an ability to like kind of shift the construction traffic to further off peak, that might be helpful to um, the neighborhood as well as, you know, kind of the typical construction schedule. Um, but then to your first point, again, the, the request for um, the intent for the construction work to continue on the weekend, as Art just suggested, if, if the board's very concerned, it may be able to be limited to one day, but one day of the weekend. Um, but just overall, it helps reduce the construction window. And that's a benefit, I think, both to um, the, the neighborhood as, as well as the, you know, the continuity for the workers on site to um, advance, advance the construction in a timely process without a lot of breaks. So if we did 7.30 to 5.30 and then uh, gave up on, on uh, Sundays, um, I think that would be acceptable. We prefer seven if uh, if there's any flexibility no noise, yeah. with no noise before then. That's really what we had in Newton, I guess. Mm -hmm. Glenn's me. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I this is Pat again. I would like to. I mean, we have a we have a little bit of time. I'd sort of like to hear a little bit from the public as to what they think about this issue. Uh, obviously, they have potential interests in a whole range of different solutions and. You know, there are other questions about having construction activities during school when kids are coming to school, and it's it's not so it's not such an easy choice. And uh, but I'd like be, be, before we close the hearing to get a little bit more information about uh, what might be feasible. I think we should remember. I, I understand that, and I, I'm happy to. 
uh, take that into consideration. Do remember that a six o'clock stop will, in the winter will probably be very dangerous and that would not be, it would really cut the work day if it was eight to sunset in the winter is uh, four, four something, four fifteen, four ten, or something. So you really have a, a uh, schedule from eight to four uh, of actual work time. And that's, that's fairly truncated. The, and then the other thing to take into account is that um, those early morning hours, that's also the time when people were starting to take their kids to school, um, which is a, a large pedestrian activity in this area as well. And so I think we want to be cognizant of, you know, trying to avoid bringing, um, you know, heavy vehicular traffic into the neighborhood while people are trying to uh, navigate the neighborhood on their way to the, the Hardy School. Something that we're familiar with is, is a regulation where vehicles can arrive before seven, um, but no, no noisy activity would happen until you know seven. And that would be earlier than most school trips would be there. So it, there's a, there, would be, there could be an advantage to moving the construction activity earlier. Even earlier. And I, I do think this is a tough one. I do think that, um, you know, if, if there is any danger to, to kids, we're going to have uh, police there. We're going to have a lot of supervisions to make sure that none of those uh, whatever vehicles might be present would be a danger uh, to, to children or, or parents. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if, if I may, um, just um, while, while we're speaking of um, kind of construction mm -hmm. and, and traffic within the neighborhood, um, just um, I forgot to mention this at the beginning of the hearing, but um, from uh, VAI, Scott Thornton is here this evening and he uh, was not able to make the last two hearings, um, unfortunately. Um, and he, he had submitted a memo earlier today that I believe has been circulated to the board. But um, so unfortunately, Mr. Uh, Thornton is in big demand and he has another hearing at 8.30 this evening. So if they're perhaps relative to um, this issue of moving, um, what we had proposed is that we would have a, a pre-construction meeting or, and to discuss you know, the traffic and the, um, the safety uh, protocols that would be put in place, police and police and uh, police detail along the route. Um, if there's any specific questions for Mr. Thornton on that, um, as well as the memo that was submitted relative to just overall traffic from the project, uh, we may want to address that prior to 8.30. Thank you. Um, I know Mr. Hanlon, you've been looking a little bit into some of the, the questions about the, the traffic generation um, if you have specific questions for Mr. Thornton. Um, let me just, the uh, traffic generation figures are, just sort of back up for a second. The, my understanding is, and I wanted to get confirmation whether this was right, is that the method of analysis is basically starts with looking at looking at uh, background conditions, uh, and that the as the decision reflects that was done fairly early on, and is not well, it's not affected by which particular proposal you you have. Um, and that resulted in an estimation on backgrounds that was adjusted seasonally and it was adjusted for the pandemic in accordance with an agreement between the applicant and uh, I believe our transportation advisory committee uh, using uh, state recommended guidelines. Is, is all of that accurate? Yeah. Um, um... For the record, Scott Thornton with VAI. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, we actually worked the, um, the we worked out that process with Beta, and uh, Beta had indicated which um, which study area 
or which intersections should be incorporated into the study area. And uh, then we worked out some uh, adjustment factors with beta to create a baseline condition. And then from that point, we generated future conditions, the background development that, that had been uh, identified um, to create the, the, the future no-build condition. And at that point, we then added the development, uh, the, the, the project uh, traffic increases to those uh, background traffic conditions. And as I remember the, the, the conclusion last, when it was still cold out, uh, or uh, was that in generally when you looked at most of these intersections, uh, the impact of the project that existed, that was proposed then uh, existed, but it was comparatively small because the traffic generation from that project was relatively small compared to the overall background flow and the future conditions. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's generally correct. Um, we had, in, in terms of the, uh, the project traffic increases, um, we were anticipating a certain amount of trips to be made using alternative transportation, uh, which brought down the overall vehicle trip increases to the study area intersections uh, to, down to a lower degree. So, so for instance, at some of the intersections, at the uh, signalized intersections at either end of uh, Lake Street, we had very low uh, uh, delay increases due to the larger project. And then as the, as the development changed, those increases got even smaller. So as, the, as I understand it, the way in which you go about generating an estimate of trips is you start with the uh, with the the equations basically that are published by the uh, Institute of Traffic Engineers, and you adjust that to the size of the project, and that is without any consideration of mode split. That is to say, people using things other than cars, and that gives you a number which then can be adjusted on the basis of some information or other. Uh, to account for non-automobile automobile traffic. Um, and if you just, I think it's, it's clear, Beta agrees, and you all agree that some adjustment needs to be made, or, uh, needed to be made in the previous project because, uh, uh, because it was clear that it was a transit-related transit uh, thing and they were look, you were looking at ways of doing it and you had a number of different ways, one of which was using the census data for mode split that was characteristic of the census tract in which the project is, is to be located. Am I right so far? That's correct, yep. Um, and as I recall, last April, you were using a deduction of about 55% uh, and that that was that is not what you're do, using now. The the uh, reduction of the mode split uh, that you would start with is 46 percent, and then for the for for the senior that will apply to the duplexes, and for the senior housing, you're using half that, so it's 23 percent. Right. Still right. Yes. Um, so the amount of adjustment for the senior listing is, is much smaller than it was last, last fall. Um, that reflects uh, lots of considerations of that, the, that this population might be less, uh, less using uh, transit less than the average people, the average commuters in the, in the census tract. Um, at that point, the effect of the mode split adjustment has now been considerably reduced compared to what you were previously previously working with, right so far? Yes. Yep. Um, and so beta has disagreed in principle with whether or not you should use this or whether or not 
uh, the adjustment, any particular adjustment can be generated by the data. But at this point, the effect of the adjustment has gotten down to be pretty small. And there are other reasons to expect that the, the basic IT genera traffic generation that you're using is conservative because of the of the uh, land use category that that you used, and I wonder if you could explain that. Sure. So, um, so, so we still think that uh, some type of mode split adjustment is applicable to the uh, to the senior housing development, um, and we have, uh, as you indicated, we have. Um, we have reduced that down to uh, to a smaller percentage um, of non non automobile um, uh, trip making. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the land use code that was used to generate trips for the senior housing development, um, we had used a code called appropriately well senior housing. Um, uh, deep attached uh, develop uh, land use code. And that assumes a certain level of independence uh, for the residents and um, and it and there's another code that's uh, called congregate care facility. And beta had indicated in their review that the site may function give, given the attributes and the discussion that we had regarding, items such as the, um, the, the services that are being provided and the expected age of the, of the residents that the use of a, of a land use code such as 253 for concrete care facility may be more appropriate. Um, we, we still use the land use code 252 to provide a conservative analysis, but um, the, the land use code 253, the congregate care facility uh, results in, if comparing that with the senior housing category results in about a 47 percent uh, reduction in the in the daily traffic that would be expected at the site and ITE notes that there are uh, some features that are present with congregate care facilities such as, Transportation service, such as um, uh, some some meals, um, sort of some types of features that are proposed with this development, and this development doesn't cleanly fit into either category. It sort of has a has a blend of both. Um, but but if if we were to use the um, if we were to use the, the congregate care facility. Um, the, the traffic generation would be even lower. And I think that, um, you know, there's, there's some arguments to be made for it, but I think that the, you know, the, the combination of uh, the Jitney service, uh, the scheduling of the, of the of staff shift times around peak hours, the scheduling of the delivery service outside of peak hours, um, the transit package and, and some of the other TDM measures that are proposed for the project may bring, may in fact bring the, the traffic generation profile of the of the project more in line with the congregate care facility. So I, I don't know. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Let me just. It it also is true that the applicant has on a number of occasions said that they were expecting an older population. Uh, to uh, to be resident in this facility than would be resident in the senior housing uh, attached that 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 you used for it, that would make a big difference in terms of or potentially make a big difference in terms of uh, whether or not what the peak hour generation is because a younger population is more likely to will have a larger proportion of people still working and still commuting and other people would be adjusting their schedules as as older people sometimes do to avoid going during uh, during rush hour. I guess one question I have is is we know that this is limited to 65 62 plus 
and uh, and I think that the uh, the land use category uh, 221 is is limited to 55 plus, but I don't really completely understand why it is that we expect this uh, this population to other than that the minimum age is 62. Why it is we're expecting it to be in the 70s, in their 70s and 80s, and and what the overall impact uh, uh, of this is. It will be open, I understand, as I understand it, to anybody who wants to live there who's at least 62. Yeah, and I'll, uh, I'll let Gwen and Art respond to that. Uh, I can say something through the uh, uh, speaker, uh, to, to, to the committee. Um, uh, we have been in conversation with uh, a likely, a very likely uh, uh, manager operations for uh, for the for the project, um, and uh, it is he's very familiar with the area. His his uh, company is managing several other communities, um, and it is his judgment that where the need is in this particular area, and uh, and just the the overall situation of, of similar facilities that the need is for people in their 70s and 80s. And that's that's just a professional making a, um, a, a, a judgment out of his experience. Okay, thank you. I think uh, if I could just add to that a little bit, and I think we might ask Bob Engler, who actually is, uh, uh, we've designed several of these facilities uh, and owned a couple. <clears throat> and I do think uh, one of the reasons, which is a little bit sad, that they push it down to 62 is you have, uh, you know, 82 year old men living uh, whose wives want to come with them in this kind of facility and they're younger, significantly younger. So that's a factor, but I wonder Bob, if you want to say anything from your experience because you've had a lot, right? Is Bob Engler on? He was. Mr. Chairman, this is, I mean, I don't want to, to go too far into this. I think that the answer we have so far is 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 pretty much all I, I wanted at this point. And I wondered if I could go back to Mr. Mr. Thornton for a minute. Please. Um, so, Mr. Thornton, the in looking at the burden on the surrounding area, the primary if the, on the transportation system, it's the usual practice, isn't it, to examine uh, traffic trips generated during the peak hour for the adjacent roadways? Yes. Um, and as, as we sort of started with, that traffic is already very high and it's going to get high even more in the, in the future. So that if I understand it right, the discussions that we're having about the mode split, the size of the mode split, the conservatism of the land use thing are all dealing are all generating are all within a sufficiently narrow boundary that none of them would affect the basic the basic conclusion that the uh, that the effect on the background traffic uh, in this area is going to be comparatively small. Is that right? Yes, yes, I, I would agree with that. But, you know, the, the, the peak hour traffic increases using Again, using this this higher land use code are you know in the range of you know by direction between eight and sixteen trips per hour. So that's you know that that's a that's a small small increase over the course of the hour. And with the um, with the with the TDM measures that I mentioned, the, those trips may not even get to that level. They may be spread or shifted outside of those peak hours. Now, the analysis also gives rise though to daily trips, uh, which I, as I recall, uh, the current estimate is 412 between the townhouses and the senior living uh, facilities. And that's for the weekday, right? Yes. And there's also, it's a little bit less, isn't it, for Saturdays and Sundays? Um, it's definitely less for Sundays. I, I don't have the Saturday number offhand or off the top of my head, but um, yeah, that's so that's 412 daily trips on the weekday. So that's the total of, of 
two-way trips. So, so it would be 206 entering, 206 exiting over the course of a 24-hour period. And so just do you have any idea what the traffic, what the existing development in this neighborhood would generate? Is that is 412 a lot in a day compared to what is already there or a little or in between? I, I think it's pro I, I think we had done a, a, a rough check uh, looking just looking at a, a Google aerial and you know there seemed to be a, 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 a over a, a, I forget how many units there were but but I would say it's probably in that in that area um, but but we haven't we haven't checked that calculation. okay Mr. chairman I've uh, I will eventually have a question from Mr. The reader who I think has done some work on that on that particular issue, but it may be a good a good time to to move on, and I and I we, I can circle back to that. Okay. Um, were there other topics from the board? I know one one topic that has um, been coming up uh, in the. Uh, the emails uh, that the board has been receiving in the last 48 hours is the, the question of the final disposition of the, the conservation parcel. So the, the portion of the existing site that is beyond the portion that will be developed. Um, and in the original application for the comprehensive permit and then several subsequent, um, <clears throat> excuse me, documents, it has been stated that the the intent for that was to um, have that property become that parcel become the property of the town, and subsequently there was discussion about it becoming the property of a, a third party who would um, take over the property. And I just wanted to ask of the applicant. Um, my understanding now is that the intent is for the um, for the current owner to maintain ownership over the over the conservation parcel. Is that correct? That is correct, Mr. Chairman. The, the owner's proposing to retain that, but to put a, um, an open space or conservation restriction on it. So it, 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 the holder of that though, could be a nonprofit of the um, restriction. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you've ever seen a, how a conservation restriction is written, there's a grantor and a grantee. So they, um, so Arlington Land Realty would continue to be the land owner, but they would, grant, um, you know, basically give up the development rights on the uh, conservation parcel. And is there a background to the, the change in direction from the applicant on this? The, I, I think it was just um, the, the owner was um, looking at the options and determined that it would just make more sense to keep it within its ownership and then to give up a conservation restriction. And, you know, normally this, this that's the more common approach in my experience in 40 Bs when there is a, a restriction involved, it's usually just a, a CR or a conservation restriction is placed on the, um, the open space parcel as opposed to an outright grant to a third party. Okay. Now, are there any substantive differences between the, the two approaches? Well, I, I mean, one substantive a, a difference is that, you know, who owns it, who owns the land outright, um, obviously. Um, but in, in terms of whether it was held by a third party that couldn't develop it, or whether it's the development rights are, are held by a third party, they're very similar in that regard. And is, is maintenance of the property, does that follow the owner? Does that follow the, the grantor? So a lot of that's spelled out within the conservation restriction as to, um, um, in, in large part, the state has a general form that they, that they require, and it provides activities that are prohibited and then activities that are permitted. And um, I, I think that the parties can basically negotiate between themselves. Um, And is there a party at the moment that the, the applicant is considering for 
um, working with for the conservation restriction? Um, yes, there have been ongoing discussions with with a third party. Um, that uh, is pretty much a, a conservation minded sort of entity. Um, Um, and then I, there was another which I, item in the, which I believe you were interested in discussing, uh, which is um, number, uh, waiver request number six, regulations upon use of private property. Um, it's a bond to secure corrections of flooding conditions. Uh, this section requires an applicant to post a bond where a structure in excess of 6,000 square feet in areas proposed within 200 yards of an existing stream or wetland to post a bond sufficient in the opinion of the commission to secure performance of measures necessary to correct any flooding conditions resulting from the construction. Uh, and the applicant had requested a waiver from this provision. Um, the board had requested of, of the Conservation Commission and of Beta Group to um, discuss the possibility of a bond and what value um, that bond should be issued in and the, the, the recommended value um, was $173,900. And I would ask uh, uh, Ms. Nova if she could um, just explain briefly the background on generating that number. Sure, so, so, so what we did, um, Beta's landscape architect took a look at the areas that would need to be um, restored and improved and enhanced and applied um, a certain density um, for, the, for the, the vegetation that was planted um, and also some of the um, earthworks that would be involved in that and um, calculated the um, estimated cost of, of that work. And is that on the development parcel or is that over the entire 12 acres? That is uh, the, um, that was, we, we did the cost estimate for the um, work, the, the landscaping work associated with the um, actual development parcel. And then the, um, which included the bordering land subject to flooding, the, the compensation area. So the development parcel. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes? Um, could you? Pull that up because I my recollection was that it also included the open space parcel. Let me. As I seem to recall, Beta had identified four areas within that memo. Let me try to locate that section that was by the parcel. I asked it. In here. I think I, uh, this one is just the waiver request. Mr. Chairman, this yes, is please. Susan Chapnick, Chair oh, of the please. Conservation Commission. Could could I respond while you're looking for that? Because I, I assisted Beta in this evaluation. You don't recall the, the name of the file off the top of your head, do you? Yeah, I do. It's Beta Memo uh, Bond Estimate Memorandum Thorndike Place, um, 20 September 21. Okay. 
And then there's two, there's two, there's a bond est estimate memorandum and a bond estimate attachment. And the memorandum specifically says that includes the following areas. Number one, bioretention rain garden area. Number two, compensatory storage area and woodland restoration area inside the project limits. So it does not include the conservation restriction area. Okay. I, I'd like to just point out that the uh, cost of doing this would be inside the construction contract from the contractor who's building the building and, and doing the site. So I don't think this is a big issue. Uh, I'm not even sure a bond is appropriate but uh, it's fine, but uh, and we'd be happy to guarantee that that work would be done. Um, but as I say, it would be, I would think appropriately something that the building department would review and make sure that it was in the contract documents. And then the contractor, the site contractor would be responsible for doing this work as part of the construction of the development parcel. That's how that would happen as I understand it. And Mr. Chairman, just for uh, reference, relative to the the proposed bond um, for the 1165R, the bond that was requested was only thirty thousand um, dollars. That project did involve relocation of a stream in the in the project, um, and also I've I've taken a look um, as as Mr. Flipfell said. We're not necessarily opposed to a bond, um, but I just question the amount of the bond that's that's presented here relative to um, kind of the track record that the Conservation Commission has imposed for um, other residential projects. Um, as, as you're aware, under 40B, um, you know, th there are not to be special sort of um, application of regulations that aren't normally imposed on other residential projects. Um, we're happy to, uh, and to agree to a limited amount of a bond, um, but we just ask the board to consider the fact that um, a project that was just approved by them sought only a $30,000 bond. And as Mr. Klipfell stated, we are committed to doing the work, but um, we just want to make Finally sure that- Mr. Chair, this is uh, Marty Nova with Bailey Group. Um, the, the difference between the two projects, um, the 1165 Mass Ave and this one, is that the, um, the area is much larger um, on this project than it is on the 1165, um, the square footage that would, if in fact it needed to, um, um, if, it, if, if it failed um, or a portion of it was failed, it's a much larger area. Ms. Over, if you could explain the difference between the, the estimate and the adjusted estimate. So the um, so the adjusted estimate is um, the assumption that there would be some survival um, in those areas, and that the um, the entire area wouldn't require a you know a complete um, replanting. Any questions from the board on this question? Chairman. Yes, please, Mr. Hanlon. I wonder if Ms. Kiefer has, I mean, we see the specific numbers here and I wonder if Ms. Kiefer or clients have any specific objections to the estimates. In other words, what we're trying to do here is to have a bond that is sufficient to do the, to do the work if it, is, if, if it isn't done. 
if it it's kind of an insurance sort of thing or a guarantee. And so the question, the first question is whether or not you've got reasonable estimates here for the cost of doing the work if there's a failure. And I wonder if there's any specific objection the applicant has to the calculations that uh, Beta has made. I, I don't think so. I think I think the uh, the number is okay. I, uh, I'm wondering, I mean, since that number will be baked into the construction contract, is there, <laughs> so it's kind of double payment in a way because you have a bond and you've also uh, contracted um, as, a, as a developer with the, with the construction contractor to do the work for maybe that same price if everybody's, you know, if the estimates are right. So I wonder, uh, you know, what would sort of make sense is that that we are required in our construction contract to show the building uh, commission, uh, the building department that we intend to do that work according to some standard that could be written uh, by, by anybody, by somebody that uh, was qualified and that that's baked into the construction contract. And that's, you know, it's another way to spend the uh, 173,000 or whatever it was, it, it's part of the construction contract. Cause I just know that's how it'll actually flow here. You're gonna have your contractor do that work and we have no problem with that it's all work that should be done mr chairman mr hanlon this is actually from miss nover but as i i as i understand it we're not talking about somebody spending 173,900 dollars uh to for, for a bond you're, you're you'll pay a premium like you do for an insurance company and the the company that that provides the bond will have obligated itself therefore to step in if there's been a default and the default could be uh, by the applicant here or the default could be uh, by the construction company that uses and ultimately ultimately though in order for the bond to be called on it's my understanding that the that there has to be a default in the people who are primarily responsible for for doing this work so you'll only actually have to call on the bond if a number of failures uh, uh, take place. Uh, Ms. Nover, is that basically how it works? The, that's my understanding of how a bond works. Yes. And do you have any idea what the premium would be on $173,000 under the circumstances? I don't. I don't. Um, Bill McGrath is going to be joining later. Um, by nine o'clock would have would would know the answer to that question. Okay, so just just from my point of view, Mr. Chairman, I mean, I, I get it that the construction company is going to be on the hook to the applicant and the applicant is going to be on the hook to uh, to the town. Behind all of that, there's this huge insurance company that is so solvent that you can be sure that they'll be there to do the work. And you're just dealing with increments of, of assurance that the work will actually be done in the way that the in the way that it's that's been contemplated. If there's not something really wrong with the numbers, I think the board is just going to have to deal in deliberations with the concept. I, I think we can let go of that. It's it's uh, the only uh, bad one thing about that is is bonds that are um, the cost of bonds is a function of risk and. Um, some bonds are cash bonds where you actually have to put up the, the number in cash and then the bondholder decides you know whether to allocate that or not. I, I think if you had a good contractor, maybe the contractor could uh, you know have that bond price down to a number that was quite affordable and I can see how maybe that would be useful uh, you know for the for the city to know that that work was going to be done so for the town I'm sorry. Um, anyhow let, let's I, I think we can get beyond it. Um, so having already gone through the speaking with the board asking for additional comments, are there any additional questions in regards to the draft decision? Mr. Mills? Yeah, I just have one question. I don't believe we've covered really the street traffic from the construction site. Um, you know, I can see dozens of workers, vehicles, contractors, vehicles, heavy equipment, uh, the trucks delivering the prefabs. Do we have any assurance the street is going to remain clear and people are going to be able to get in and out of their driveway 
Is that a condition we should be adding? Um, I would ask that question of the of the applicant: Is have you made have you considered at, up to this point where you know where the the workers who are working on the construction where they will be parking during the day? I think. Um... My take on that anyhow, and Stephanie step in or Gwen uh, or anyone, uh, maybe Scott, uh, you know, Scott, if you're still on, I, I know you had to leave. You need to unlock your... But anyhow, there would be a plan that would be worked out with the building department as to how all that is handled, you know, where you park or don't park and mm -hmm. uh, police details. And uh, uh, I, I don't think that uh, even if we tried to do something that wasn't acceptable, we'd be, I mean, it isn't so much we, it's the contractor, would be bound by, uh, by certain things that would be in a construction plan, you know, a plan of how the building gets built, and it would be monitored by the building department um, and their inspectors. And um, I, I think that's something that needs to be worked out on a, you know, street by street basis and day by day basis and hour by hour basis, and there'll be a lot of detail. Just to Finally interject. Page 37, item E16 states clearly, parking of all vehicles is to be on the property. Thank you. That makes sense. Correct. It's, it is a, a normal practice prior to any construction for the contractor to provide a detailed construction management plan and to go through that very, you know, month by month, week by week with the, with the building department in the, in the town. And that would include, you know, the when and, and how the police details would be and, and so on and so forth. So that's there to be worked out. Whatever rules are laid down that would be, uh, you know, beyond the contractor to abide by those. And we would care about that as a developer and uh, obviously the building department would as well representing the city. Good time. And to the chair. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, pardon me. I, I was just saying uh, through the chairman, if I may also just chime in um, in response to uh, Mr. Mills question. As, as uh, Gwen, I think was the one that had stated it, that uh, there will be a, a pre-construction meeting and there will be um, the details of the, the flaggers that are gonna be out there, the police detail, the, the timing of um, if there is a need for road closures, that will all be established. And, and that's generally through a, a condition that it's a, a um, kind of a, a construction traffic or construction mitigation sort of meeting is held that those details are ironed out. And um, at, at this point, it's typically a little premature to iron those out. You really need, once you have you know, your contractor on board and then they work through it. Um, but to also kind of further respond just for clarification, um, we know that while there's construction going on, we're not gonna be at, we're not gonna have an increase in traffic from the residents because the project won't yet be built. So um, it's, you know, one type of traffic issue that's separate and apart from the traffic generated from the project. Um, and again, that's handled typically through a, um, a pre-construction meeting with the contractor and, and working out the details. And so we expect that that to be a, a condition that the board would impose within the decision. Okay. <clears throat> Bill, does that address your question? Nope. Well, I do know that inspectional services really doesn't have any bearing on the parking situation, et cetera. And I do believe we should have some guarantees for the locals. We have a huge construction project occurring on some very narrow streets in immediate proximity to homes in driveways. And I just think uh, we should put some conditions in there that those driveways should never be blocked and these people should have 100% access to their homes. That's all. Okay. We're there with you. I'd just like to add that, that um, the, there, the portion of the property that is going, is planned to be open uh lawn area is going to be available for parking on site from the beginning and and that's it, it'll be free from any building construction 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Anything further from the board? Pages here. Seeing none. Are there? Were there any? So anything in the draft decision that the applicant wanted to raise? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Please. Uh, I'm scrolling through my version as well. Uh, I will. I will. I will focus primarily on the condition section. So I'm trying to find which page that starts on. Starts on 23. Thank you. Um, give me one moment, I apologize. Uh, within condition, it's it begins, I believe, on page 29. So it's um let me see the first. It goes up a while. And so it's C1, and then if you go down, it is C1 I or E I, pardon me. Right, oh, you, you scroll up a little right. bit. Okay. E. All right, okay. Um, and within subpart two, there was a three year uh, vegetation monitoring schedule with a 95% survival rate. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, in subpart six, it speaks to survival rate of the plantings less than 100%. And then in section subpart seven, it goes back and talks about uh, plant survivorship uh, less than 95% of the third year report. I, I believe that um, the commission in discussions with, with Beta even had in their memo of October 14th had referenced um, the survival rate at 80%. And so I believe that all three of those uh, to be consistent with the commission, the joint Beta commission memo would be at 80% survival rate. I believe that's correct. Ms. Nover, was 80% the, the final figure we had settled on? You know, Mr. Chair, I, I, I don't recall. I, you know, I, um, I think Susan would be able to answer that question. Okay, Ms. Chapnick? If I may, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, the, it, it, unfortunately, the, um, the letter that Beta and the Arlington Conservation Commission submitted um, for the record to the ZBA, which is, is in the record and, and on um, the website, it came one day after this draft. So uh, our letter came on October 14th and your draft is October 13th. So many of the um, edits that we recommended and additions that we recommended did not get into this draft. That's one of them. The reason we changed it to 80%, and actually we also added some more specific requirements, very specific what should be in the plans. Um, we made that clearer. Um, but the reason we changed it to 80% is in understanding um, the environment generally and in, um, in consistency with what we defined for 1165R Mass F 40B vegetation replacement plan. Um, so we wanted to be consistent with that plan. And when you have time, Mr. Chairman, I would like to just point out a few of the key differences um, between this October 13th draft and what Beta and ACC recommends. I will put a note to come back to that. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Chairman, just to... Um pick up on that, I know you're gonna get back to it, but within the combined beta ACC memo of 1014, um, they speak to um, on a, a, a mitigation plan um, for flood storage and they have subparts A through E 
um, as opposed to what's here is one through eight. And um, I, I think that the applicant would would it is fine with the proposal that the ACC beta of their 1014. So it would be our recommendation that the board replace what is on page three of the beta ACC memo with subparts one through eight of the draft decision. If that makes sense to you. It does. Okay, okay. Um, and then moving on from there, um, I think my next specific comment um, gets into C, the last sections of subpart C, or maybe C2 actually, right, C2. Um, and then under L, the uh, I, I it, it seems like there's two different concepts that are going on in paragraph L. Definitely does. Yeah. So I don't know if the board meant to make that. What's the second sentence should actually be the M or not? Um, and, and this gets into um, somewhat of a, of a larger issue in terms of. The, uh, um, the setting aside of $100,000 in escrow towards solid waste removal slash invasive species management. And, and I believe that there's other parts that um, the, the board has kind of taken concepts of what the applicant had proposed in the MOU and then blended it into the decision that have worked out a little bit better, if you will. Um, and I think that the intent here is that the board is trying, or the, the draft presented to the board is, is trying to put that concept out there. Um, and so if we can just footnote that for one moment um, and then move on to subpart M where it says that as a condition that the applicant and the town sign a mutually agreeable memorandum of understanding uh, regarding the disposition of conservation parcel. I believe that that would not be permitted under 40B to make that a condition um, because it would be a, uh, a condition subsequent and the applicant doesn't have control if the town of Arlington refuses to enter into a mutually agreeable. So, and that's, that would be a local permit or a local approval of some sort. Um, and I, I think that that's problematic to impose that as a condition. That so being said, that I'm sorry, go ahead. As I was say, what, the, what the, the intention of the board and, and is that we would include as a condition that um, in the absence of, an, of a signed memorandum of understanding that the, that the following conditions uh, would, would hold, but that if the, if the town and the applicant reached a separate memorandum of understanding, that would take precedence over the, these sections. He, that is exactly where I was going, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> that um, to impose a requirement of an MOU, I think exceeds the board's authority, um, but I don't want to um, undercut our commitment to try to work with the town towards that. But the way that, and I, as I reference it, it was stated for another aspect of it, it was in the absence of the applicant with the town meeting an agreement, the board would impose. And so that would be for, that would apply to that L1 or whatever you want to call that yeah. extra one there, correct. Um, and then in M, it, the second sentence of that says the applicant has agreed to the terms outlined in finding 71 above. Um, I think the numbering is off, but I also think that that's not entirely relevant or, or maybe appropriate even. Um, it, I, I think if you're looking for what the board intended, it would be 73. And not 71. I think it's a, a numbering sort of issue. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I would just suggest that um, it's as correct as a finding that the applicants propose that a portion, um, you know, approximately 12 acres be put under a conservation restriction. Um, but then it there's a little bit more, you know, opinion from the town that the town's expressed significant concern um, and, and so forth. So. I don't want the applicant to be 
signing on to, you know, the first part is factual. The second part is what, what the board is holding in its opinion. And so um, in terms of putting that forth in a condition, that sentence should be stricken in our opinion. Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, it could be a separate condition. Certainly. A separate finding. Or a separate finding, yeah. Um, or just before the D's. But you had recommended to swap, swap to locate the position of D and E, which makes sense. Because of right, the right, exactly. Um, and then Uh, again, in subpart F there, that's what you were talking about before, though, in the absence of a signed agreement between the, um, and I think that that kind of phrasing might mm -hmm. be better suited for the 100,000, so. Absolutely. Um, and, but also there within F, um, the applicant has, um, it, it, it's, as it's worded in the draft, it says, um, it's prior, well, you have to go back to D1, it's, it's prior to, um, uh, a certificate of occupancy for any structure in the project and the, um, the proposal that the applicant had put forth for that $25,000 annual was upon the final. So actually it would be under D2, not D1, the timing. Mm. Um, and then when you move on to, it says under E, uh, our, our comment previously that carried over in your draft was make section D, or, or I suppose that you may want to make it section C3. I believe that there is no C3 currently. So um, it's project design and construction. So it kind of flows more with what the other C. Oh, I see. Okay. Yep. So it's just a stylistic thing, um, not really a substantive. Then if you go to condition, um, proposed condition E10, I, I, it will, E9 and E10 both, I think those both would be um, more subsumed with what the final plans should include. Um, under E13, just a request for a clarification that it's on-site utilities and not all utilities. So no utilities within the public way, but on-site utilities. Under F4, I would suggest that the uh, the that the condition read the applicant shall ensure that emergency vehicles can ad can adequately maneuver through the site as required by the state fire code or in accordance with state fire code provisions. Under uh, section Mr. B. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I wonder, I mean, on the previous suggestion, I wonder if Mr. Kiefer could, ex could explain what it is that the additional language and substance changes. I, I, I think that there's, as it's presently written, um, it's just unclear what does that mean um, can adequately maneuver. So if we have a, a baseline or a reference, um, that, that just adds a little bit of clarity to it. That would be my suggestion. Let's see, okay. Thank you. Uh, 
Mr. Chairman? Mr. Mills? Yes, I think I brought up this question of uh, access to fire vehicles before, and specifically the very front of the building. Uh, there wasn't a roadway completely across it. And I was assured that the applicant was going to get the review of the Arlington Fire Department to make sure they were happy with that situation. And I dropped my objection. So I would like to still have the Arlington Fire Department be mm -hmm. starting off on uh, the design of this project and yeah. access to it. And they absolutely will. Thank you. I, I um, through the chairman, I, I wasn't in, um, trying to infer that the Arlington Fire Department wouldn't be reviewing. Under Section G, police, fire, and emergency medical conditions, there's a there's a condition G two that's proposed. Um, I, I think perhaps for clarity's sake, uh, just to have that read that it uh, stairwells and garages um, are to be designed um, per uh, state building code requirements. So the minimum two or fire rated. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I'm sorry, but I just like to, right now it reads the stairwells and garages must be minimum two hour fire rated, and then there's a comma. And then it says residential units must be minimum one hour fire rated or as required by the state building code. So the provision as required by the state building code applies to the residential units, but not the stairwells and garages. And my question is whether in fact, the state building code does deal with the stairwells and garages whether it exists to do that. And secondly, I'm, I'm guessing that this language came from Mr. Haverty, uh, what the reason is for having the state building code provision in the second clause, but not the first. I actually think this language came as a result of comments from prior versions. I don't think that the state building code language was in the original draft. Um, and I don't think that there's any reason why the state building code reference shouldn't apply to, to both aspects of this Absolutely. condition. We should change it to state that. And I think the, the purpose of including the reference to the state building code was basically if somehow in the future the, the um, requirements were actually changed to require something more strict that I mean, they would have to comply with the state building code irrespective of what's in the condition, but this would just provide more clarity. Okay. Under subpart H, it would be um, H5, I believe. Oh, no, I'm sorry, H6. Um, for some reason in H, my, my version didn't print out numbers. Um, again, on-site utilities, we would request that change to be adapted. Um, and then the second sentence where it says the applicant shall request a grant of location, uh, it's actually the utility companies, my understanding is that does that. So um, uh, perhaps change it, the uh, applicant in conjunction with the utility companies um, would request a grant of location. Under H9, um, I don't believe the board has the authority to require an easement to be given by the applicant. Um, and then getting to the third sentence in that H9, all sewer service, 
I think it should be clarified that it's all sewer service for the senior living residents should utilize agent sewer lines. Yeah. I know the the residential units, I, I know there was some discussion, but there was some memos in regards to the sizes of those required plumbing for that. Um, the request for the larger sewer easement, I believe that came from the engineering division. Um, I would just ask uh, Kelly Linema if she knows why that may have been requested. Sorry, can you, this is for H9? For H9, it was a request for a temporary wider sewer easement beyond the existing 10 feet during construction. I do not know. I'm, um, I'm going to refer back. If you give me a minute, I'm going to look back through the memorandum provided by um, Wayne Chenard. Okay. Just to see if there's a specific rationale for that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yep. Well, Ms. Lineman looks that up. I, I wonder if we back away from whether or not the board has the power to require an easement, which is after all a property interest and that's complicated and maybe all you really need is permission to do it and a, a license or something like that. But is, is there actually an objection on the applicant's part to the substance of this, that you don't wanna provide that wider area in which, in which the town can work to provide this stuff? Or is this just a, is this, is this just a legal thing or is the thing have to do with what it is that you're, that you're willing to allow uh, the town to do to do this work? Well, well, I think in part, I don't know that we know what the town wants to do. <laughs> so um, maybe Kelly can provide us with that answer in a moment, but I'm not certain what the purpose of it is. And um, so if that could be clarified, that would be helpful. So I'm, I'm pretty sure, Mr. Chairman, that if we if we knew if we were in a if we knew exactly what what this was about uh, in substance, it would be possible to figure out an appropriate way to write a condition that would not raise any difficulties under 40B. No, certainly, and and the the ZB is, is the the final note under H9 that I had added that. Uh, zoning boards of appeal cannot grant easements. They have to be granted by the board of survey, which in the town of Arlington is the select board. Mr. Chairman, it wouldn't be the zoning board granting the easement here or, or the, the, the select board. I believe that this is requiring the applicants to provide an easement to the town to allow the construction to occur mm -hmm. on the applicant's property. And I guess I, I'm going to echo Patrick's question, um, which is, is there an actual objection to this? Because if the easement isn't provided, um, I'm not sure that the you know, sewer department has the ability to provide the service that the applicant is requesting. Um, I just want to concur with what council and um, Council Haverty said, um, it's just an easement for construction for the town to have access. Thank you, thank you for chasing that down. Doesn't seem unreasonable to me. Yeah. Is there any objection on the applicant's part to <laughs> allowing access to additional <laughs> land if, if we don't call it extending a temporary easement to allow the town to perform? So. Perhaps not. I may, I may, if John is unmuted, ask him just to, and still not, because I thought that our, we had talked about the prior hearing that the sewer line that was associated with the project was actually the one farther um, from the property line. Um, if I may, John Hessian, um, Mr. Chairman, they, you know, our understanding of, um, public works request here. There's an existing sewer line within an easement on the Thorndike Place property that runs along uh, the Dorothy Road frontage and, and the property line. And I believe the easement is 10 feet wide today. Um, so that's an existing main 
this project, we have been requested, as uh, Stephanie just mentioned, um, we are not, our project is not connecting to that sewer line that's on the Thorndike Place property. We're connecting to the sewer that's located in the middle of uh, Dorothy Road. So, you know, again, it, I think our question is, the the sewer easement is overgrown today. There's vegetation there. We're going to have to clear it and and partially uh, do some maintenance of that easement. And with the construction of the um, you know the duplex units and their driveways and front yards, you know the sewer department, the sewer division will will have much better access. The vegetation will be cleared. Um, again, it's it's a question of what construction is proposed there um and and to be honest if like we talked last meeting with the storm drain easement if there are sewer improvements that need to be done on that line um the time to do it would be during coordinated with the construction of thorndike place um we wouldn't want to construct all the driveways to the duplexes all their sewer you know and water connections out to the street their front lawns and landscaping and then and then have to come back in and, and disrupt all that with sewer line improvements. So um, again, our, ours is a somewhat of a, a lack of understanding of what what the need is and if there's improvements that need to be done, or is it just protecting for down the road if something does have to be done and what would be the the reasonable you know size of that easement. Um, for the sewer division to be able to do future work. Well, it's it's definitely not protecting for something down the road because it says it's a temporary during the period of construction. It, right, and that's, uh, again, John Hesson, that's part of what is confusing. You know, we're not aware that the sewer division is doing any work for this project or any other project on the Thorndike Place property, um, you know, and if, if it, it, it it's not clear if it has like the last part of um, that H nine upon completion of construction, the applicant shall notify the Arlington Water and Sewer Division to conduct a post construction evaluation of the sewer main. Um, if this is a concern that the construction is going to uh, negatively impact that existing sewer line, um, we've we've provided a, and I think we drafted it a, a condition. I'm not sure, Stephanie, if you remember what number it was, but that we would, you know, perform a TV inspection of that that line pre-construction notify you know the sewer division of any deficiencies in it you know pre-construction um that though any repairs on any existing deficiencies would be the responsibility of the town and then we would tv it again post-construction and any damage that was done to it would be the responsibility of um you know the applicant but in essence it would be the applicant's contractor or their subcontractors that would have done the damage. But um, so again, not knowing what temporary work, what work they intend to do that they need a temporary easement. Um, it's, it's really not in opposition to it from our perspective, but it's getting it right. What's needed, why is it needed? And let's make sure it's done, done right. And, um, you know, the right size easement, does it need to be 12 feet or does it need to be 15 feet? Mm -hmm. um, a, a little bit more clarification would uh, would definitely help smooth this one out, I think. So if we were to sort of change it so that the, the applicant would, would, you know, in, in conjunction with the engineering division, um discuss access to the easement and any possible any expansion of space um during the period of construction something along those lines would that be 
I, I think that we could agree to that, that the, that the applicant, you know, um, will agree to um, uh, have discussions or however you just phrase it with the, uh, with engineering relative to um, the, uh, the department's, you know, request for um, a, a temporary, you know, access or, or temporary widening of the existing sewer easement um, during the construction period. As, as, as John stated, it, 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 yes, if, if there's plans that the town has to do work on that sewer line, um, it makes complete sense so as not to have our project be built. And then the town comes say, oh, we were gonna, you know, we need to rip this up to do repairs to the sewer line. So absolutely coordination makes sense. It's just, there really has been nothing that's come forward in terms of, because the sewer line isn't part of our project. So okay. what is the, um, what is the intent there? Um, and then just to kind of um, provide the link for you, John had mentioned that we had proposed a CCTV as a, that we would would offer it as a condition. That's you find that in uh, proposed condition E six. I remember coming across that earlier. Right, and then um, I, I guess also <laughs> just in terms of the the second part of H nine while we're still on there. Um, and, and I guess I would have John propose uh, revisions because the I think from from an engineering perspective the uh, the second sentence uh, John uh, I think you and I discussed some alternate language my notes don't have that alternate language there. Oh, the the applicant shall provide the Arlington Water and Sewer Division with upgrading sewer flow with peaking factor, suitable capacity. Um, it, uh, Mr. Chairman, if you could scroll up, I, it might be H4. Uh, maybe H3. So uh, I think we were, kind of thinking of mimicking the language in the second sentence in H2, the applicant shall provide the Arlington Water and Sewer Division with calculations to ensure the distribution system for the area has the necessary capacity to meet. So H2 is specific okay. to water um, and, you know, it's really the same kind of requirement for sewer. So H2 does say all water and sewer infrastructure. Right, but then the second sentence oh. says um, distribution system. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. So instead of distribution system for water, it would be collection system for the sewer. And again, and then again on H9, the last sentence, um, as John had referenced, that uh, CCTV condition that we had proposed. So that would be somewhat duplicative. It's already addressed in E6, I believe the number was, I said. And then within section I for wetlands floodplain and environmental conditions, um, uh, request for clarification under I-2 that the applicant will be required to obtain an order of conditions under the Wetlands Protection Act. All right. Uh, within uh, condition, proposed condition I-9, uh, there's a reference there about uh, the work shall be conducted 
in accordance with the approved erosion and control and sedimentation. Um, and then the, the next sentence that's underlined, I'm not certain why the underlining is there. I just assume it's, it was just a formatting sort of tweak. Um, the, the 21 days of final grading um, seems a bit tight. I would suggest 21 days. Is that, in the, is that in the last line, that 10 days? It's in the, no, it's in the second sentence, within one week. Oh, within one final week. Grading. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I would just ask um, Ms. Nover her opinion of that. Yes, Mr. Chair, I'm looking at a version, um, I believe it's the, one of the marked up version and actually the um, sentences underlined were struck, um, just leaving the first mm -hmm. sentence. So. The applicant would be fine with that. <laughs> but yeah, I know. So I don't know if it actually was, it was, it was, you know, suggested for striking. Um, so it looks like it was kept in. So I guess the question is temporary set of uh, stabilization measures approved by the board required should work be uh, interrupted for more than 10 days. I think, um, you know, 10 days is is a short period of time and I, you know, 20 days would probably be more realistic. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, I just want to, there are two things I want to focus on. One is, is that at some point in some draft or other, this underlined had a note from Mr. Haverty saying discuss with the board. Um, so presumably there's a question as to whether it should come out or not, which I don't know that we're able to deal with now. Uh, but the language that Ms. Kiefer is talking about is in the second sentence, as I understand it. We now say within one week of final grading, and she is proposing within 21 days of final grading. And the question is, uh, what would be Betas or the Conservation's uh, uh, Committee's reaction to increasing that one week period to 21 days, three weeks, basically. Okay. Okay, so there was the wrong sin. Um, I think within one week of final grading is 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 reasonable. This is um, Susan Chapnick, Chair oh, yes, Chapnick, please. Conservation, if I may weigh in. Yeah, that's that's um, that's standard. Uh, we don't want um, erosion into resource areas, and if you let it. I mean, even a week, you know, you can get a storm or something happening and then the disturbed area is, it, it, the sediment just gets into the resource area. So it, it's a reasonable request and consistent with what we usually require. <clears throat> all right, we'll take all that under advisement. Uh, if you could scroll down to proposed condition I-23. Okay. Um, it presently states with uh, application of sand and salt within 100 feet of resource areas is prohibited. We would request that to be revised to within 100 feet of EVW or IVW. Um, just a, a note of explanation there. The, uh, the walkway that's in front of, for instance, the bike storage area, um, that's within 100 feet of BLSF. And uh, we would want to have that sanded. So, and then there's probably some other locations. So um, I think the intent that provides the protection is that it's within 100 feet of IVW, BVW. Um, I may respond to that, uh, Chairman Klein. I was just gonna ask for that. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, we, did, we did make a, a recommendation to the ZBA um, about this. Um, we would like it to remain um, resource areas, but we do 
have an allowance for that area um, that Ms. Kiefer is talking about because we expect that that area would have, um, so, so we, we propose the following sentence. The foregoing does not apply to the clean snow removed from the emergency access road. You don't have to copy all this down, it's in our comment letter, but I'll just read it. Um, from the emergency access road, as long as no sand or non-approved de-icing materials are used and the snow is clear of all foreign debris. So we understand that there are alternative de-icing materials. We, we recommend uh, products such as magnesium chloride or something similar um, that, that have been um, recommended in, in different types of, of manuals that you can find online. And we have a reference for that. So, so we're acknowledging that that's, that's impractical in that area, but we're saying you can't use the normal de-icing um, materials. Would that be a reasonable um, alternative? They do that in Cambridge. So we checked what they do in Cambridge. I, I think my one kind of question or concern then would be, um, because you, you impose a condition that you want it to be easily enforceable. Um, and so in terms of the, you know, the, the management staff that's gonna be there out clearing these things to make it very clear to them where they can apply um, certain items. I, I think that, again, going back to my suggestion of just 100 feet of IVW, BVW, um, is, is a, a clear, but to make certain that there is compliance because those areas can be very easily identified. Um, otherwise, I, I, I guess I would ask John if you have any comments in terms of what um, Ms. Chopnik's proposed um, proposed provision would be um, in terms of, I know that you know, you know more readily which areas of the project might be in within 100 feet of um, the LSF that um, might, might um, propose challenges for compliance with the condition as written. Yeah, um, I, I guess I understand the alternative de-icing materials, but um, one of the, one of the questions I had on this was, so under the local wetland bylaw, you know, the 100 foot buffer or ARA is a resource area. So is, is the intent of this is that we would not be able to sand or salt within 100 feet of the 100 foot buffer slash ARA, or in other words, within 200 feet of um, a BVW or IVW? No, it's just a 100 foot. So the aura is is the the aura is 100 feet from the resource area, and it is a resource in the town, as you said, that is equivalent to the 100 foot buffer area of the Wetlands Protection Act. It is not in addition to. Right, but the way this is written is mm -hmm. no application of sand or salt within 100 feet of a re resource area. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be. The the R is a resource area, so that would say we wouldn't be able to use sand or salt within a hundred feet of the R, which is two hundred oh, feet. I see. And so it needs to be clarified. That yeah, makes sense. and mm -hmm. and that's why Stephanie was suggesting replacing resource area with BVW or IVW. Right, or maybe within a hundred feet of BVW, IVW, or within the R would be. Yeah. To clarify it. Yeah. Um, and then we are allowing for a practical exception for the emergency access road because that right. is the aura. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And absolutely. Okay. Understood. I understand yeah, I think, what you're saying. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think it, it was just a little mm -hmm. confusion on the, sure. the definition of resource area. Okay. Sure. Thank you. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and then if we could just scroll to I-27. Yep. Uh, I don't think that the phrase, it says the applicant shall submit for review and administrative approval by the board, a restoration plan for the, for the proposed compensatory flood, st flood storage areas of the site. Um, I think that perhaps we want to say a, a planting plan because we're going to be creating those uh, compensatory flood storage areas. So 
um, I, I guess in, some, in, in one extent they're presently, they are vegetated, but we're gonna be regrading it. So I think it's more a, a planting plan would be a, a more appropriate phrase there. Um, we do have in section C, we have to make this consistent with section C. So section C did request a compensatory flood storage plan, did it not? Yes, uh, that's, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's not- That's I-26, that's still there. Excuse me? So I-26 references, uh, the applicant shall provide compensatory flood storage is indicated in condition C1. Oh, okay. Go and then oh, you're just clarifying that this is in reference to the planting plan versus the compensatory flood storage plan. Yes, this is, is I-27. Um, uh, oops, sorry. Applicant shall submit for review and administrative approval by the board. And we had, it currently reads restoration plan for the proposed compensatory flood storage area. And the request is to clarify it to, to read a planting plan for the proposed compensatory flood storage area because it, we're not restoring it, we're, it's being created new. Okay. Okay. Uh, moving on to proposed condition I-28. Mm -hmm. um, and, and perhaps um, there can just be some explanation um, because as it's presently written, the applicant shall submit for review and administrative approval by the board. Um, generally you see for, um, for review for um, administrative approval, you know, inconsistency with this decision. Um, this seems to be, an, I, I'm not quite certain what that administrative approval, like what are the conditions, like could it just be withheld and withheld? Um, um, and maybe Mr. Haverty can weigh in with alternate language, but if there's something to tie it in, you know, consist, you know, administrative approval to review it and approve it as consistent with the requirements of the decision, um, but I'm not certain that there's any specific parameters that it, that it has in there for that invasive species management plan. So that would be my first comment on there. And then um, there's, I have two comments on that one. And then um, in the middle of I-28, where it says um, uh, for work within the aura, I would just um, clarify that to just say 100 foot buffer. The, um... The invasive species management plan was recommended as a, a, a condition um, requirement in C as an addition. So the Conservation Commission and Beta in their comment letter um, recommended adding that plan. So now you would have three plans in that section that reference wetlands. One would be the compensatory flood storage plan. One would be the planting or landscape, however you're calling it, planting plan, and the other would be the invasive species management plan. And it is, um, we recommend a definition there, what, what should be included there. Um, I think that we've used the term aura consistently throughout. It is a resource area in, in Arlington. I don't understand why we would change it to the 100 foot buffer in this, in this instance, especially in reference later to waivers where we're, we're allowing a waiver in the OR for certain specific activities that, that are going to be done consistent with the plan as proposed. So I think it might be confusing at this point and unnecessary to change the term here. Uh, I'm fine with the second one. And then I don't know if um, your council wanted to weigh in on my first point. Have any? Which one are we talking about? So this I is the use of the term um, review and administrative approval and whether that grants the board essentially the ability to, to drag its feet on things. And, and you've actually used that term in several conditions, so. Right, right. And, that, and that is language that has been blessed by the Housing Appeals Committee the, the thing is, the, the, the purpose of calling it administrative approval is that it doesn't start a new hearing process. It's not a 
you know, there's no notice hearing requirement. It's not an approval process that could be subject to an appeal. It is simply a process where the board administratively reviews information that's being submitted post permit and ensuring that it's consistent with what was approved by the board. So, I mean, if, if there's a request to put some sort of time frame for that review, I, mean, I, I don't think that's unreasonable. Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. um, I think it would be helpful if we could take a look at, I mean, really, the, in my view, at least, the proposal that is before us is what appears in the ACC beta letter of October 14th. And the paragraph that relates to this is at page four. Um, and I think that the applicant should be looking at that one because that's the actual language that uh, is most is most likely to be considered by the board. Um, and I want to give you a moment to do that. But, you know, essentially, there's not much point in looking at what I-28 should say if we already have the invasive species management plan, which has been a submission requirement. If that would actually, as far as I can tell, largely obviate the, the provision of a plan in I-28, although provision of something that verifies that the plan has been carried out might be the appropriate thing to be in that in that part. I leave that up to Ms. Chapnick. So this is on page four, the bullet that appears at the top of the page, right? Ah. So the invasive, the language that is in, that is proposed for section for part C uh, for the invasive species management plan is there. And I'm assuming they're not two, that this is the only one that we're actually thinking of requiring. You'll notice that it includes a reference to monitoring reports submitted to the CPA. So there's an element of self-enforcement here. Um, also, I'll point out that we're not trying to make it onerous. And if you look up above, um, because the planting plan requires certain monitoring as well, we say that the reports can be combined because we assume the same entity that might be doing the planting might also be doing the invasive management and you know they could submit one report on the plant health as well as the invasive management of the area. Uh, uh, through the chairman, may I ask for a clarification on the monitoring reports then? Mm -hmm. um, with that statement, is that proposed um, annually for all of those, all of the monitoring reports in June? Yes. I would, uh, uh, just as a, to clarify then, I would suggest that that be put in um, if the board adopts the Conservation Commission's proposed language for the management plan um, under the invasive species. I don't think there is a, uh, I don't think it says in there um, on the basis, so annual. You're right. Now this section was just the plans. I, I understand that the conditions say they might reference the plans and then they might have some specific condition on that, um, which is what I understand the difference being. It's our recommendation um, and Beta's recommendation that several of these be in perpetuity um, that would survive the, the, perm the expiration of the permit and that um, is consistent with what we did in 1165R uh, Mass Air 40B because these um, restorate these mitigation plantings, um, these these invasive control, et cetera. These are um, provisions that protect the wetland resource areas on the site, 
And if we just say, oh, they're just for three years, then what happens after that? So um, not that you have to submit monitoring, monitoring reports for three years, but that it has to be, the, the plans have to be followed um, in perpetuity. So that's a recommendation from Beta and the Conservation Commission that the ZBA should consider um, adding to these. So the monitoring would be for three years, but what would start in year four? Well, they, the, the plan that they have in place has to keep happening. Okay. So the plans should have specific requirements for how to remove invasives, um, what to look for, um, you know. So the plan. I, I'm, I'm not a wetland. Per, you know, I, I don't. I'm not. I'm not a, a landscape person, so I don't know exactly what would be in there. But. So the the plan that's instituted would continue. It just there would not no longer be a monitoring requirement. Unless you want to have a monitoring requirement. Um, so, so for example, at SIMS, which has a conservation restriction in that area, we still have a monitoring requirement and a reporting requirement to the Conservation Commission. So you could request that. I mean, I would leave that up to the board, but at a minimum, we'd like to see that the plans be implemented in perpetuity. But those are a part of the conservation restriction, correct? Um, yeah, I was just making an analogy. This this part that we're talking about is not on the conservation restriction land. This this these conditions we're talking about are for the areas that are being disturbed and revegetated on the site, including the compensatory flood storage area. I would ask if, if John, if you've taken a look and if have any um, reaction to um, page four, the invasive species management plan proposed condition. I'm taking a closer look at it. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, can you scroll to the, the exact part that's in kind of in question? There's the invasive, it's, just, it's not the invasive species, it's the. Was it the invasive species? It is. It is the yeah. invasive species. Oh, there you are. I guess, you know, I'm looking at that, that bullet, um, you know, talks about an invasive species management plan. Uh, the second, the, so the second sentence, kind of defines what's in the plan, the monitoring reports are kind of uh, 
detailing any invasive species and recommendations for control and, and removal. That's that's really more of a um, should be more either a confirmation of the next step in the plan or a recommendation for uh, a modification to the plan. Uh, for example, maybe the method of removal that was proposed in the original plan as part of a monitoring report, it shows that it wasn't effective. There may need to be a recommendation for an alternative. Um, so there, that third sentence could maybe, maybe be uh, clarified bit and then the uh, yeah, and then the, the last two sentences are I think pretty straightforward what would be included in in a normal you know site visit monitoring report. Kevin, does that, do you agree with that? That's acceptable to me. I think that's reasonable, John. Okay, great. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Um, I just, I mean, the, uh, We've gone through some of these provisions. The the other plans that are both referred referred to the immediately immediately previously are things that if the applicant has not already taken a look at and provided us with all the information they have to provide, um, they may want to take an opportunity to do that before we close the hearing because. Uh, the proposals that are before us really are will include both the landscape plan uh, and the uh, uh, the the uh, compensatory flood storage mitigation plan, and the language there is in each case some a little bit different anyway uh, from what was in the draft opinion. And uh, the applicant will want to devote the same attention to those as uh, it has to the uh, invasive species management plan. Uh, with respect to, um, I'm, I'm sure that John probably will have some further comments, but with respect to um, the compensatory flood storage mitigation plan. Um, my suggestion in terms of ease of the recipient of a, the permit, understanding it and just complying with it is to take out the narrative um, relative to what the goal is, but just to put in the bulleted points A through E what the requirements are. Um, that would be fine with me. I know um, Pat Hanlon is, is is doing a lot of wordsmithing, but I'm wondering if in the findings you could put um, what the, so we don't lose the reason for this compensatory flood storage area, or it might already be in the findings. And I'm a little confused as to which draft I'm looking at. So I'd appreciate that. Would be, we, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate what you're saying. Ms. Keeper, thank you. Mr. Chairman, Please just in terms of uh, getting in the findings, we can always cross-reference to make sure that that anyone looking at this this would know where the finding is and, and vice versa. Certainly.
Um, with respect to the proposed landscaping plan, uh, similar comment there that the kind of the introductory narrative um, is not really um, instructive as a condition, but that the conditions um, follow the proposed A through H. It, it continues on the next page. You don't see it right there, yep. what's on the screen, but. Um, And again, that's acceptable um, to the Conservation Commission as long as it's it's captured in a finding. And, and just for clarification, though, the the landscape plan is only for landscaping within um, wetland resource areas. Um, yes, unless unless the um, board wants to extend that, but but these are specific to the wetland resource areas because they're requiring native species, et cetera. Um, and we understand that for other areas that are not within wetland resource areas that you may use, uh, you know, traditional landscape plantings um, that may not be native. So is a matter, you know, when when the landscape architect is doing a, a landscaping plan. Um, it's typically one plan. And so the board may want to consider um, not imposing these additional requirements on, on the upland areas, but rather um, it, it seems to create a little bit of confusion if one's having two landscaping plans submitted. Um, right, and, and it could be, yeah, it could be one plan and then just make it clear that these specific requirements are for the wetland resource area parts of the site. Mr. Chairman, yes, please. Uh, Steve Moore, uh, as a member of the Arlington Tree Committee, mm -hmm. uh, I only interrupt at this point because um, the landscape plan was also uh, going to be helpful and useful for the, the tree warden and the applicant to work together uh, to make sure that uh, the tree bylaw uh, issues were followed, even though uh, I know that the waiver uh, was denied as unnecessary for the, uh, the signature of the tree warden. So uh, I believe we are expecting the landscape plan to also cover the upland areas particularly around the development. So there, a landscape plan was filed by the applicant. It's, um, it should be available, but this project very specifically is um, under the town bylaws as they existed in 2016. Correct. So I, 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 I just, I don't know what the, you know, the specifics of what the tree bylaw was back in 2016. And no, you're, 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 you're correct that at the time um, it was not required uh, for the signature of the hmm. part of it. Uh, however, the landscape plan is to confirm that we, because the applicant said that they would already work with the tree warden and we're sort of counting on that commitment. And the landscape plan was gonna be a part of that uh, cooperation. With, with a specific tree focus for, for the tree warden, of course, not the rest of the planting. I, I, I apologize, uh, Mr. Chairman, for my speech. <laughs> Um, okay, yeah, so the, the, the landscape plan should be available on the town's website at this. Um, okay, thank you. Yep, well, you're very welcome. So we were, leave. We've sort of gone a little off topic and gone back and forth, but I think we were on I-28 when we left off. Unless there's anything further on the, um, the plans. And uh, I don't have anything further on the plans. If I don't have a landscape architect from our team on, but um, 
John, if you need to fill in being our landscape architect for the moment, if there's any um, specific concerns or, or recommendations that you may have vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the proposed um, ACC letter. I'm taking a quick look again. Um... Just to help you, John, understand um, things that are focused on vegetation, there is, is a recommendation of low, low nitrogen fertilizer use yeah. and limiting that. And then um, no herbicides or, or pesticides or rodenticides except as approved for invasive plant management. Right. Okay. No, I think um, I, I definitely reviewed this uh, previously and just looking at it again, I, I think it's um, I, I think it's what we've discussed in in the past. Um, you know, I'm just looking rationale for removal, um, you know, hoping that in this plan that that narrative will be pretty simple. It's removal of the vegetation to construct the compensatory storage area as, you know, approved as part of the comprehensive permit. Um, but yeah, I, 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 Stephanie, I'm, I'm okay with this and, and just back if I could, well, I'm, well, I got the microphone to Mr. Moore, the, there was a landscape plan included in the most recent plans, but it's also included as a requirement. Uh, I think it's in C1, um, that we provide a more detailed landscape plan for the non-wetlands portion of the property um, as part of the, the final plan. So the plans that are submitted um, to date are what's referred to in this draft decision as the approved plans, but we're gonna have to prepare final detailed construction level plans and, and there'll be additional landscape information provided at that stage. That's, those will be prior to building permit. Uh, Mr. Chairman, for you, thank you, Mr. Hesh, and that's, uh, that's a help. You're welcome. If, if we could move back to the decision then. Um, in I-30, um, again, just to carry through that 80%, it's referenced a couple places in there at 100. And um, if, uh, if Susan needs to jump in, if, if the October 14th letter has changed this, but I would uh, go down to I-33, I believe. Um, I, I think that that provision was going to be deleted. Ms. Chapman? Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> I'm going to um, I-33, um, let's see, hold on. Because <clears throat> the numbering's changed. Yeah. Yeah, because we already addressed that. Um, let's see, no disturbance. Somebody. Was that in that? That was in the beta letter, I believe. Is that right? The original beta letter. I'm getting confused as to where things are. Marty, did you yeah. know? Okay. Yeah, I'm looking at the um, the edited version of the right. Thank you. Decision right now. Okay. And um, there was actually two paragraphs that talk about this actually no limited activity that was actually struck oh. yeah it was struck yeah, yeah. i'm just looking oh, out too yeah. Yeah. i can leave my yeah. name 
on the screen so people will think I'm still there. So I-33. So they will call on me. So think, about halfway through I-34. Um, so I just, so are you saying we, we're striking I-33 to I-34, but we're leaving I-34 because there's just a formatting issue and I-34 got starts about halfway mm -hmm. through the paragraph under I-33. Yes, I think that's a formatting yeah. issue. Yeah, yeah that's I, a formatting yes. issue. So, so the long-term pollution prevention and operation and maintenance plan still needs to be. Yeah, we'll leave that there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and picking up though on um, the bracketed comments for I-31 and 32 relative to invasive species control is exempted. Um, I'm assuming that that would be um, clarified and it would just take out I-33. I, I'm that's okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back on that. So, so Marty, what I'm knowing, the problem is these numbers changed. Yeah. So, no work shall be allowed within the 25 feet of any bordering or isolated vegetation. That one remains in, mm -hmm. um, and and except for invasive species control that that has been approved as per the plan or whatever. So that's right. Um, then the no disturbance within 50 feet that we just took out, we actually left that in and said no disturbance shall be allowed within 50 feet of any resource area except as shown on the approved plans. And that any changes to the project plans that will result in the limit of work to be closer to bordering or isolated vegetated wetlands or would result in further disturbance of the aura would need authorization from the board and or the conservation commission. So right. if you look at the prior draft from, I think Paul and Beta, mm -hmm. it was their I-34 yes. edited um, that should remain in. And it, it went from I-25 to I-34. So the numbering, mm -hmm screwed up. And then the old, this is Marty, the old yeah. I-35 is struck. So right, and that's what this 33 yeah. is, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's why it's confusing. So we're, we're missing one. Yes, I-34 was removed altogether. Well, it, actually you have part of it. It's I-32 here. Okay. So it's so I-32 okay. was the old I-34. Okay, so no disturbance shall be allowed. Oh no, it should be changed. So no disturbance shall be allowed within 50 feet of any resource area. So that this is except as shown in the proof plan. Yeah, so that one is the one that should go back to the draft that was Paul's previous draft. I don't know if you want to go That's through the one with the comments. That's the one with the beta comments, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. And it so this this I thirty two should be changed to that poll draft with beta comments I thirty four. And then I-33, as Marty says, has struck, because we, we dealt with that. Then the I-34 struck. Mm -hmm. okay. And if I may, Mr. Chairman, um, yeah. the, the language in I-31 relative to um, any change in the project plans that would result in the limit of work closer to bordering or isolated vegetated wetland. Um, the authorization can only come from the board, not the commission. Okay. Right. You could just ask us our opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Yep. And then 
just for clarification, is the Arlington Conservation Commission's recommendation that um, the condition also include that invasive species control is exempted? Yeah. From those provisions? Okay. Yes. Uh, I believe condition I-35 is duplicative of um, I-34, right? That's the formatting issue. So I... Uh, yeah, so there was a note on the prior version that said to combine what was then 26 and 27. Okay. So I-34 and I-35 need to be combined. And then I-36 was supposed to be deleted because we have, that's a finding and we have defined the need for landscape plans, et cetera. So it's not necessary to have that here. And I believe I-40 is duplicative. My notes don't say where it's otherwise contained but I, I think it's someplace else in the decision. Oh, it might be it. Um, I-5 is, oh no, that's not it. I thought it was up further somewhere too. I'm not sure where it was. We can hunt for that. Uh, condition I-41, um, I, 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 I am not quite certain how that's enforceable. Um, the applicant is to ensure that the proposed mm -hmm. rain garden will function. Um, I think instead you would just want um, to say that the details of the um, additional detail of, of the proposed rain garden would be shown on the final plans. I think that's gets the board to what it wants is to make certain that it's a, a, you know, a detailed design. So I would recommend that that be um, language saying that the uh, that the proposed rain garden for the detail of it will be uh, shown on the final plans and then include that with what's to be included on the final plans. Yeah. And also we did specifically call out the rain gardens in the landscape plan. So they, they have to be discussed. Okay. Obviously. And then moving to the general conditions under J3, there's a, a somewhat of a, a, a sweeping um, statement that uh, the applicants are copied the, the board on all correspondence um, between the applicant and any federal, state, or town official board or commission concerning conditions set forth in this decision. Um, I would just propose striking that. Um, there's prior conditions in the permit that say that the applicant shall provide the board copies of all, you know permits and approval, state, federal requirements. Um, and I, I think that's the intent of what the board wants rather than all back and forth correspondence. Um, it, it may just get into the mundane. So um, I would suggest striking that condition in its entirety. And, and like I said, you've already built into um, the decision previously a requirement that the applicant copy the board on all permits and approvals. I would just ask Mr. Haverty to address that. Mr. Chairman, the only thing I would say is that this provision requires the board to be provided copies of all testing results, environmental approvals, uh, official filings. So there's it's more than just um, just other approvals. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do agree that perhaps every single piece of correspondence is a bit of overkill and more than the board administratively is going to want to deal with. 
Okay. And I think there's probably a happy medium. And the applicant would agree to that. Um, that uh, if it's if it's limited to, um, I think approvals would be previously addressed, Paul. But um, you know, in addition to all approvals, the applicant shall provide the board, you know, copies of um, testing results. Um, I'm not quite certain what else the board um, uh, official filings, environmental approvals, and other permits. So the re recommendation there is just to to remove the all all correspondence to just be more particular. I would I would change that to the applicant shall provide the board copies of all testing results, official filings, environmental approvals, and other permits issued for the project. Okay. Right, concerning the conditions set forth in this decision. Yeah. So moving that phrase from below to where all correspondence had previously been. Okay. Um, under Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, I wonder if I could, before we get too far away from I, uh, I was a little slow, but we do have two conditions about dewatering. One of them is at I-6, and that's taken from the 1165R decision, and the other one is I-40, which we talked about briefly, and they both deal with the same subject, but I don't have an understanding as to which one is, to, as to which one is preferable. They're not exactly the same. So that's I six. Next to I forty. I believe the applicant was fine with I-6. I wonder if Ms. Chapnick is also happy with I-6. Um, does I-6 have the number five in it? The dewatering shall not take place in any manner that leads to water being discharged or allowed to flow into property. Now. So they're basically very similar, except I'm not sure if that's in I-6. And that was done expressly um, for abutters. Oh, but this one also has authorization from the DPW. We could take part five from I-40 and insert it into I-6. Mm -hmm. That would be fine. Because it basically has the same, you know, pass-through filters, on-site settling basins. So, yeah. And, and just to add, add the um, item number four. Thank you. J, was it J6 we're headed towards? Uh, J, I was going to direct us to J5. J5, okay. Um, uh, it's currently drafted in the event that the applicant or its management company fails to maintain the stormwater management system for the project mm -hmm. in accordance with this operation and maintenance plan within 14 days of notification. Um, it, it's, um, I would suggest, because something, um, it, the, it's phrased a little bit backwards. So basically what it's saying is if you get a notice from the town um, that there's a problem, it, it has to be maintained. And I would just suggest that um, 
in case a part does is isn't able to come in um, that it instead of saying fails to maintain but fails to meet fails to advance advance efforts to maintain so you know to address to start working on the solution or, or addressing what the problem is but if there's an issue that um, like I said there's a, there's a part that needs to be ordered and it's not coming in it doesn't mean that the applicant has just sat back and done nothing they're working on it but the 14 day time period the part's not able to come in Although fails to take appropriate steps to maintain the stormwater management system. Um, that, that's probably fine, Paul. But but you see where I'm getting at. It's it's just saying if the applicant sits back and does nothing, that's one thing. But if the applicant's actively trying to get the solution in place, mm -hmm. um, they shouldn't they shouldn't be penalized for that. And just for clarification, then in item J6, condition J6, rather, the second sentence talks about the proposed recreational areas. I, I think that means the proposed garden areas. Is that correct? Probably the language from the prior decision. But there are. Over what, what used to be the area on the western side uh, that had formerly been parking, it's now like, like there's gardens sort of mm -hmm. established there or um, there's also house of recreation or something. But I believe there's also woodland areas that are being maintained as well on the development parcel. But is that, is that what that means? It says proposed recreational areas. I think that was originally there when there was intended to be a playground. Yeah, Mr. Chair, landscaped areas. Right, and then the phrase, the construction and operation just seems a little, that's why I wasn't entirely certain what the where the board was going with that or whoever drafted the condition was going with that. This is Steve Rivalak. I think Mr. Klein had, might, I think Mr. Chairman might be right um, that it is referring to an earlier iteration, which included a playground. So in that case, should we strike the second sentence? I would think that it makes sense, but again, this is for the board's consideration. Yeah. Okay. And then under J7, I uh, suggest striking the first introductory clause, notwithstanding any provision in J6. Just start it with the town shall have uh, no obligations. Um, relating to the, um, the I, I would just say relating to the conservation parcel. Uh, construction, again, the whole point of the conservation parcel is not to construct. Yeah. Um, so I would just say relating to the conservation parcel. Um, and then I would suggest, uh, unless it may be agreed upon by the parties uh, within a separate MOU. And then if I could just quickly go down to uh, the proposed waiver actions. Yeah. Um, 
I there's under uh, five for uh, uh, aura under article or section 25, excuse me, of the uh, wetland regulations. It's, it's proposed to be um, waived as unnecessary. Um, Did additional language come up here? Because, oh, oh, sorry. Um, I would just suggest that it be um, uh, approved consistent with the final plans. Uh, Chairman Klein. Yes, please. Um, that was acceptable to the Conservation Commission because we consider it similar to waiver three. And if you scroll up, your language was waiver granted to allow work within the aura as shown on the approved plans. Okay. Um, we, we recommend we, we had we had recommended um, we, we just want to make sure that that we're not saying that that we're waiving the aura as a resource area. Right. That's not what we're doing, but okay. Thank you. And, and the applicant's fine with that. Okay. Okay. So waiver three will same language as three. Yeah. Okay. Um, I believe that we've already talked about the bond proposed. Um, and then under seven, um, the wetland consultant fees, um, the, the regulation isn't worded to allow um, kind of like continuing oversight by the board, but those wetland regulation fees um, or consultant fees, excuse me, they, they deal with when an applicant files a notice of intent under the local bylaw that the commission can then retain a wetlands consultant relative to reviewing that NOI and issuing an order of condition. Um, I think the, the language, I didn't have a chance to go back and look at the 20, the, the version of the regulation in place when we applied, but the current one, um, which kind of underscores this is um, consultant fee, uh, Upon receipt of a notice of intent, um, abbreviated notice of resource area delineation or request for determination of applicability or any point during the hearing process, the commission is authorized to require the applicant to pay a fee for the reasonable costs and expenses borne by the commission for specific expert engineering and other consultant services deemed necessary by the commission to come to a final decision on the application. Um, this fee is called the consultant fee. Um, and so, um, Paul may weigh, weigh in and say, well, it's, it's, it's waived because it's not necessary, but um, the proposed board action here is denying it because it's needed due to the complexity of that. Um, so again, going back to what, what the regulation says, what it's to be used for, it's to review an order of or a notice of intent or an ANRAD, um, and then to issue an order of conditions. And so that's not warranted here because this is a master permit subsuming them all. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, when the applicant goes back before the commission under the act, um, if they feel the need for consultant fees, they have um, the ability to employ 53G and to ask for those under the act. So um, we would suggest that um, this either be granted or just denied as unnecessary because the uh, master per the comp permit is a master permit subsuming all of that. So the board doesn't have to retain a wetlands consultant to review any local application filed under its local bylaw report. This was um, unclear to me, makes a little more sense the way you explained it. Um, we had retained this for the 1165R um, Mass Ave. So I, I am fine with saying that it's it's waived because it's unnecessary at this point. If if that's if Paul Paul tells us <laughs> or some other lawyer that <clears throat> that interpretation is correct and that then the um, conservation commission could retain and apply for um, the the consultant fees 
under um, the filing under the state Wetlands Protection Act. So I'm fine with that as long as the legal argument is correct and I'm, I'm not, I don't understand it as, as well as others. So Chairman, the, the legal argument is correct. You've already gone through your review process. You've already imposed what peer review consultant fees you have deemed necessary to review this project by law. And the Conservation Commission certainly has full authority to charge review fees um, under the Wetlands Protection Act. So this isn't gonna hinder their ability to do that. It's a completely separate process. Whatever you say in this decision can't grant or take away jurisdiction from the Conservation Commission as part of that process. So I, I agree that this waiver could be denied as unnecessary. I would retain the sentence that the board does not require additional authority to impose a fee for the retaining of an outside wetlands consultant, which it has done for this. Mm -hmm. And I will leave it at that. Um, and then scrolling down to uh, 22, I believe, the off-street parking requirements. The, uh, uh, it grants the waiver. Um, however, there's, um, there's actually kind of two parts to it. So there's for the uh, uh, senior living, the analysis there talks about that the parking is 0.76 spaces, um, which, which is correct. Um, but there's also with respect to the um, the duplex units, um, and it was found it was in the findings. I, I I don't know the number of the findings, but it does recognize that the end units there would have one parking space, right. and so we would ask for that to be uh, just made certain that that's carried over into the grant of the waiver there, um, because it's only addressing the the waiver as to the senior living, but it doesn't address that for the those duplex end units. Because the twenty in twenty sixteen, we we still required two parking spaces. Is that I correct? believe so? Yes, I think we did. Yeah. Okay. At this point, I think I've. Um, I think I um, hit the items on the conditions and the, and the waivers that I wanted to address. Um, um, if I could just be indulged one moment to open up to my team if there was anything in the conditions or waivers that I missed or that um, was a concern. At this point, is there any, any further from the board? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, just previously when we were talking about transportation, I unwisely deferred talking, conferring with Mr. DeRuiter about uh, the comparing the amount of additional traffic generation on a daily basis here with uh, the community. And that was a long time ago and we're getting really tired. I, uh, I'd, I'd like to get that in the record because if we don't have it in the record, we can't rely on it. And Mr. DeRuiter at least has done a rough calculation to give us an overall idea of, of what that proportion might be. Although I emphasize that it is rough and not something very precise that we could work with. Um, and wonder, I think it takes about a minute and a half, but I wonder at the chairman's discretion when the right time is to deal with that. Certainly while Ms. Well, Ms. Kiefer is checking her notes, this would be a good time to do that. So Tyler is, I don't know if Tyler is still here actually, it's very late. We've been at this for three hours. Sure, I could, if I may, Mr. Chair, this is Tyler DeRuiter with Beta. Certainly. Um, so we had uh, taken a look at um, some of the, I guess what I'll call um, a quick look at the neighborhood trip uh, generation for the number of buildings or households that are within the neighborhood that do not front Lake Street. So houses that would have to use the neighborhood streets and ran a trip generation calculation for those and compared it to the trip generation presented as part of the 
proposed project. And in the comparison, we found that the proposed project represents approximately 18% um, increase in trips in the neighborhood. Um, I don't know if I need to go any further detail um, to that. If it's just if I can just as quickly, my understanding of the way the calculation is reached is by taking the trip generation figures for single family and for two family. Basically, that's not precisely the way the categories are listed in ITE and just assume that the neighborhood is half one and half the other. Basically, the two families have more trip generation, obviously, than the single families do. Uh, so it could be an error because the mix might be skewed towards single or duplexes, um, but mathematically that error doesn't really amount to very much uh, that in anything in the reasonable range is going to give you a percentage that is similar, though not identical to what Mr. DeRuiter uh, just indicated. Tyler, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. We've basically taken the two single family and multifamily land uses and average the two together and then applied that average over the number of households within the neighborhood that we counted up, um, you know, in a rough estimate estimate there. So um, in doing that, uh, we can get a, a general ballpark of, of what the neighborhood might expect per ITE. And, and to the point that was made, you know, that that may slightly overestimate um, the number of trips given uh, maybe a, a higher percentage of single family homes or, or whatever have you. Okay, Mr. Chairman, the, re the reason for going through this is that we were asked last time to take to consider uh, this question. And while this isn't a, as a careful census of every individual house and how many people are in it, uh, it gives you sort of an order of magnitude uh, number that uh, relates to some a citizen concern expressed last, two weeks ago. Thank you very much for bringing that up. Um, Ms. Kiefer, did you find anything further? Um, I don't believe I have anything further at this time. Thank okay. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right. So in a moment, I will open tonight's hearing for public comment on the revised draft decision. First, I really appreciate everyone's patience. I did not anticipate this portion would take this long. Um, and second, a brief review of guidelines for this portion of the hearing. Public questions and comments will only be taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. The board will insist that comments be limited to items either in the draft decision or items that are omitted from the draft decision. Uh, to provide for an orderly flow, the chair will insist that individual public speakers try to limit their comments to five minutes. The procedure for requesting to speak will be the same as for previous hearings. Please select the raise hand button from the comments tab on Zoom or dial star nine on your phone to indicate you would like to speak. When called upon, please identify yourself by name and address. You'll be given your five minutes for your uh, questions and comments regarding the draft decision. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. Uh, once all public comments have been heard, the public comment period will be closed for the public hearing. Um, and I'll do my best to show the section of the draft decision uh, that is being discussed. Um, the board has, you know, over the past uh, year and a half, two years, I've received a very uh, lengthy record of public opinion in regards to the propriety of the project uh, and to its impacts on wetlands, its impacts on traffic and the like. Um, at this portion of, at this set, you know, junction in the hearing process, we really are uh, discussing what elements are to be included um, in a potential draft decision, which is what we're looking at here. Um, and so I, I really ask the public's indulgence to uh, try to stay as tightly as we can to items that are in the decision and uh, not to stray from that. Um, so with that, um, we do have a list and the first name um, is Ms. Eurowich. Hope you're on mute, sir, sorry.
How's that? That is wonderful. There you go. My name is John Urowicz. I'm a 53-year resident of the town. I live at the corner of Little John and March Street. Uh, first and foremost, uh, while you were talking about traffic just a few minutes ago, um, 90% of this traffic coming out of this place is going to be coming down Little John Street. So what all the houses you counted in the neighborhood, Little John is going to get clobbered with all the daily counts that you're going to have. That's horrible. Going back to a discussion earlier on uh, regarding the Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays, I want to go on the record as being a very, very loud no to Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays. That's 102, 104 days a year of construction noise we don't want. Saturdays and Sundays and holidays are family days, barbecues, playing in the yard, playing in the street. If my neighbors would please stick, me, stick with me on this one. If the owner is going to not own the conservation land, it's going to go to somebody else. Is the $350,000 maintenance that they pledged a couple of years ago, are we going to lose that as well? You remember that $350,000. Um, I would be interested to know if that money is gone because of this new change in bait and switch, if you will. Um, the 7.30 to 5.30 hours, uh, that's a 10 hour day. Uh, I don't see why it has to be 5.30. Can we make it 7.30 to 4.30? We discussed that earlier tonight. Um, lastly, I would hope that the town has some sort of inspection going on on at least a weekly basis to monitor what goes on in a, side, in a project this size. I see too much bad construction practices happening when they put all these duplexes on Little John, I mean, on, on Dorothy and Mott and Mary Street. They, they don't patch pavement well at all. It's horrible, as a matter of fact. I, I would hope that the town provides us with construction management at least on a weekly basis. Um, so uh, Saturday, Sundays, holidays, no, 7.30 to 4.30. Uh, the $350,000 that was gonna be pledged, um, site inspection, and oh yes, and let me reiterate what uh, Ms. Noyes said earlier, the parking of all vehicles on the property, not on the street, that's on your page 37, item E16. Thank you very much. I appreciate the work that you do. I hope you understand this is my neighborhood. My neighbors love this neighborhood. Okay. This is not good for us. Thank you. Good night. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Ms. Kiefer, um, just to, to clarify, the, the ownership of the conservation park parcel has no effect on the, the pledge of the owner to provide $350,000 over uh, 10 years for the preservation of that property, correct? That's correct, that's correct. Um, and uh, to Mr. Klipfel, um, would a 7.30 to 4.30 work day be something that that would work for, um, for this development for a weekday work day? Uh, you're on mute. Okay. The question 730 to 430 instead of 730 to 530. I said to 5. Uh, 730 to 430, I'm the only one that's got $8. Uh, well, it's going to be $8. You said 730 to 430, right? 730 to 430 was the question. I think that could work. That's 4.5 and... Sorry, having a hard time hearing you. It is calculating. I, I think oh, that's... calculating. Thank you. <laughs> we'll, think, we'll, we'll go for that. But, I, I guess the, the, there, there is some... Um, somebody can drive in and park and be there without doing, doing work. 
um, not making any noise before 7.30, right? Noise. Yeah, so the, the, the way the town bylaw is written is that the, the, it's, a noise, it's a noise ordinance. So there's you know, right. it's the operation of, of you know, exterior equipment. Yeah, okay, that's, I think that's fine. The, the, the operation of, of equipment between 7.30 and 4.30 is, yeah. is that's, that's when it was. I think that was. Okay. And then uh, what would the weekend uh, be? Would that remain the same? So it, I think you had you had originally indicated that um, you'd be willing to forego Sunday at, Sunday and holiday hours. That that's correct. And so Saturday does the Saturday hours we would need to has not been discussed. They are in the town bylaws. They're intentionally later to allow people. Um, an opportunity to sleep in a little bit. Um, I think it was suggested, uh, I don't remember exactly, it was nine to five. Might have been nine to five instead of eight to six. Yeah, I think that's okay, nine to five. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, so far, Mr. Yurovich has only been the only person that has had a chance to weigh in on this. And I think that we might wanna have the discussion about Saturday after, more people have had a chance to do this. I will point out that this is a noise ordinance mm -hmm. and the primary interest here may not be noise, but activity on the street. So we ought to at least keep in mind that it's, it's somewhat more general than the interest is in the, uh, <clears throat> than the interest is in the, uh, in, in the noise ordinance. But I, you know, obviously people have, a choice to make, or, but they don't actually have a choice. They have the choice as to what they would prefer, whether they'd like it the, the process to go a little faster by allowing work on Saturdays, uh, subject to the noise ordinance as it is, or whether they would like to encourage the applicant to uh, take a little extra time and give them all or part of their Saturdays. Thank you, that's well taken. Um, with that, I'll move to the next name on the list, um, which is uh, Mr. McKinnon. Mr. McKinnon, are you there? We'll come back to Mr. McKinnon. Um, I had Jennifer Watson on next, but I don't know if she's she heard she has lowered her hand. Ms. Watson. On the bed. Um, Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, first, as uh, a resident of the town, um, I'm uh, referencing here the finding on page 20, number 73, to do with the parcel, as well as the, uh, the October 4th letter uh, that was generated uh, by the attorneys relative to the parcel, um, the, the open space parcel, that is. Um, I know that uh, there's been a lot of discussion in the town over the past, oh, I don't know, uh, three, four days, something like that, to do with this, to do with this open space parcel and the fact that the applicant is now going to retain ownership. Um, I think originally it was proposed as a, a kind of sweetener of the deal, uh, basically the open space being uh, donated to the town, transferred to the town for control, as opposed to retained by the, the owner. Um, and that now seems to have changed uh, very much at the last minute here, it seems, or maybe I just didn't understand the MOU process, but this is kind of a sudden uh, large scale change. And uh, I think it's leaving a bad taste in many people's mouths. It looks sort of like a, a going back on a, a previous 
promise that was an important promise made as part of the, uh, part of the project. Um, again, maybe I don't understand clearly the MOU process, but uh, I hope that that under those discussions, the, the potential donation of the property to the town for ownership and permanent control for, of the open space part uh, would be uh, reconsidered um, because I think there's a lot of concern about perhaps any covenants being put on the property now and in perpetuity might somehow be undone in the future. Uh, but that's just a, that's a personal um, concern. Uh, and secondly, as a member of the uh, tree committee, uh, if you go to uh, page 55, which is item uh, waiver number 10, uh, I know that um, uh, there's, this was rolled into one of those things. I believe the, the request for a waiver was unnecessary because the comprehensive permit process subsumed all of those bylaw concerns. And uh, it said that the, uh, the applicant was going to basically uh, substantively comply with the bylaw, the 2016 version of the tree bylaw. Um, and I want to uh, remind the applicant again that that means uh, working with the tree warden, although his approval is not required in 2016, as it is now on the building checklist. Uh, working closely with them is, is important. The landscape plan that's being generated as part of the final plans is important to help make that happen. Um, as as well as submission of a tree plan uh, related to the trees, both along the public ways and, and for the setbacks in the project. Um, that, that that is, I believe the applicant has already committed to comply with all of those things. I just want to reiterate that for the record, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, to the chairman, if I may. Uh, yes, Ms. Kiefer. Uh, just to address Mr. Moore's comments, um, I'll do in reverse order. Um, uh, yes, the, the applicant has agreed to work with the tree warden and, and submit the information. Um, and then with respect to the um, open space parcel, um, it's, it's, it's actually, it's, it's not a, a sudden change. Um, it was, I, I can't remember when it was first, it was going to be um, initially conveyed to a uh, to a third party, um, and now it's just going to be a, now it's going to be a conservation restriction. Um, but I, I think two points that um, are, are relevant and, and may provide some comfort um, within the um, imposing it to be a, a conservation restriction. Um, the applicant's amenable and has agreed that it will be available publicly for um, passive recreation, um, and so there's there is still a a public um, availability of it, if you will. Um, so um, I just wanted to underscore that it really, it, it has been discussed for a bit, this, this model with a conservation restriction um, and that there is public benefits that are you know, desired by the town and intended by the applicant. Um, and then I, I think maybe just the last point is one of, one of the initial discussions um, Talking about the MOU, there there had been actually hesitancy by the town, not wanting to acquire it, and we were looking for a, a third party to acquire it. So um, it's you know I, I think that there was um, some some that in part you know weighed in to our decision, but um, but I think the important part of it, as I stated previously, is just that it's not um, it's not intended to cut out. The, um, the surrounding community that it will be made made available um, for public use and and you know public access if you will um, so I hope that addresses the concerns that you raised. Thank you, Ms. Kiefer. Yes, thank you, Ms. Kiefer. Uh, next on my list uh, was Jason Flick, but his hand is down. Um. Which brings up uh, Ms. Keith Lucas. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Doing well, thank you. Heather Keith Lucas from 10 Mott Street tonight. Please. Thank you. Uh, the regarding the construction start time, um, not going to weigh in the time of time itself. 
but I want to make the point that the pandemic has changed people's work patterns, meaning many people now work from home and people are expecting to work from home moving forward more than more so than going into the office. So the noise generating from this project will impact all of us during the day. Um, the noises and, and the trucks, they, they already disrupt our, our sleep. We hear that from Route 2. It wakes, it up, wakes us up. It shakes our houses. Um, and trucks to be here before 8 a.m. or even arriving before then sounds like just a disruptive way to start, start our day. Um, to Mr. Hanlon's point, any noise, not just the operating construction, but the arrival of, of many people who are going to be working in that area uh, will impact the noise quality in, in the neighborhood, which, which is quite quiet in um, most, of, most of the time, <laughs> I was gonna say at night, but it is uh, during the day as well, unless you're hearing the squeals of laughter um, from the kids um, who are playing during the day. If we could go to um, section 48 on page 14. Okay. So this paragraph here talks about the, the traffic and, and the volume and our, the overall neighborhood concern. And what we talked about on our last CBA meeting for this project was the, the rush hour traffic volume at a handful of the neighborhood inter intersections to Lake Street. And it appears that, you know, section 57, a little later on, there's a placeholder to include these traffic volumes to be included in the ZBA decision. And I just ask that the ZBA include the known traffic volumes here within the section 48, as it di is directly relevant to the applicant's estimation of trips per day generated. In other words, like the, the relativity of the traffic increases are important for the ZBA's discernment of, of the development of the size of whether it's appropriate for this neighborhood. Um, and to our discussions at the last CBA meeting on this topic, yes, uh, on an additional suggestion of just calculating those 412 trips if spread out across maybe a 10 or 12 hour period because that does equate to today's current state rush hour um, to be an all day impact to this neighborhood. And that would be as opposed to being the concentration at, at two times in the day. Correct. And, and perhaps that, I mean, I, I know the, the 412 trips um, that's estimated by, by the applicant also is considering that they're going to spread out deliveries throughout the day and not have those fall on more rush hour time periods in part because of the traffic concerns that exist on Lake Street already um, and how that will have downstream impacts to, to other towns as well uh, during, during the rush hour time. Um, but to have that as a going from, you know, very few cars, if any, going down any of our streets during the day to um, a rush hour traffic, that, that's quite a difference. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I should just emphasize that the 412 number comes directly from the ITE. Uh, it, I think, includes mode split, but it does not include various other things like jetneys and, and moving your time of day around and so forth. It's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite objective and, and not, and much of the rest of the things that the applicant and others were talking about are not boiled into that figure. Thank you. If I may, in yep. section 57, which is on page 16. Yep. 
it begins with in an attempt to address these challenges. Um, and I don't, with respect to the traffic and, and characterizing the reduction of 15% of from a prior proposal, I, I just don't find the character characterization of in an attempt to address these challenges of this significant traffic impact to this neighborhood appropriate. Um, I, I'd suggest and ask the ZBA to consider removing this given its subjectivity. Um, the relative, the, calcul the recalculation of the estimated travel, uh, sorry, the recalculation of estimated volume of traffic does not address the challenges, but quite simply is a recalculation due to the change in building use that's being portrayed. Um, with respect to just the, the traffic overall, I didn't find any evidence within the draft decision that mitigates the massive traffic impact the development as proposed will have on the neighborhood. Um, it doesn't appear to have a contingency truly to address the traffic concerns um, without an alternate route to exit and enter the area. It, it really puts an undue burden specifically on Little John Street, but also into smaller neighborhood streets. So the only way I see possible to truly mitigate the neighborhood concern of this traffic is by eliminating the assisted living building, sorry, the, the senior housing. Um, and, and allowing the project to have the duplex only housing along Dorothy Road. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Ide. Uh, good evening. Yeah. Pardon me, I can't speak, it's getting late. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, this is Nicholas Hyde. I live at 152 Lake Street, mm -hmm. the corner of Lake and Littletown. Mm -hmm. So uh, first of all, thank you very much for your continued support and your openness to hear residents' concerns. Um, with reference to the draft decision that we're discussing tonight, uh, I have two comments. So the first is, start off as against item 55, but uh, as others have mentioned, it's really item 55, 56, 57, and 48. It's that whole ensemble of things. So um, one thing is just please note that Lake Street is not the right benchmark at all. The right benchmark is really the traffic that originates from and returns to the neighborhood. As Mr. DiBiase mentioned at the previous meeting, the Little John Dorothy intersection is perhaps the most relevant benchmark. That's literally where the uh, complex would have its sole entrance and ent exit. Uh, it's a very sleepy uh, location at the moment. Uh, and also, please note that much of the traffic that if you did an actual study, any traffic you would have logged in any study would include a substantial amount of both cut through traffic off of Lake Street uh, and Thorndike field traffic, especially in the evenings. Uh, just last week, I was standing talking to my neighbor next door, and uh, I've watched many, many cars uh, cutting through Mary Street, blowing through the stop sign. Uh, this is what they do. Uh, and it was and it was all during the, the Lake Street backup in the evening. Uh, and it's in violation of the signage that's clearly posted off of Lake Street. And it was actually substantial enough that a police detail was brought in to reduce it. Uh, so I went out for a walk. When I came back, the, the police were there and the, the problem had gone down. But th th this is what we're dealing with even now uh, without this project. So um, just to continue on this, this first comment, um, based on Mr. Hanlon's pertinent questions, it really seems like we still have questions about the existing traffic. And as a resident, I would like to ask the board to consider inclusion of you know, a condition regarding an additional traffic study to the board's satisfaction, uh, as well as a condition that uh, the approval would depend on the traffic increase due to this completed project being qualitatively shown to be no more than a small percentage, hence qualitatively not significantly affecting the existing neighborhood traffic and quality of life. So Mr. DeRoyter uh, commented this evening about an 18% increase overall. That's significant. Uh, that's quite significant. If you raise my salary 18%, wow, that's great. You raise my taxes 18%, oh my goodness, right? So that's 18% is a lot. 
Uh, and then if you combine that with Mr. Urowitz's comments about the specific fo focused effects on Little John Street, uh, that's very pertinent as well. So uh, that's my first uh, comment. And my second comment, which is a bit more brief, is about uh, item E16. So I agree with Mr. Hanlon. Uh, we should consider no project construction work on weekends and holidays. This project is massively different than any other that we've ever had in the neighborhood. The other projects are generally duplexes. They're generally one at a time. Uh, that's pretty different. Uh, the disruption to the neighborhood from a project of this size will be significant during the construction. Um, please note also that during the week, children do start going to school as early as 7 a.m. I know my kids do, and perhaps even earlier at other households. Um, based on this neighborhood's location and only having access to the outside world via Lake Street, there's really no kind of back way to and from school. You have to go out of the neighborhood on the places where people are going to be coming in and out for construction traffic and everything else. So it's really not clear to me that any level of police detail will be sufficient to help keep the neighborhood children safe during the week. And it's pretty clear that construction of this scale on weekends is going to have a negative impact in the neighborhood. Um, so I also agree with Mr. Mills and Mr. Urowitz uh, that traffic for the current residents should not be impeded uh, by parking for the construction. Uh, so the last sentence in this section, E16, is very important. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Uh, that was all that I had. Thank you. Thank you. Next on my list. Uh, uh, was Anna Kukarski. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Anna Kukarski at 34 Mott Street. I had a couple of questions and comments. My first one is also on section 47, uh, 57, excuse me, about the traffic. Um, this paragraph had claimed to address the traffic challenges, but I also agree with the previous uh, comment that I didn't find any evidence to address the challenges of the traffic impact. Um, particularly from a traffic safety standpoint, um, since you know the streets are you know very quiet and local. My street is a one-way street. Um, right now, there are only stop signs um, on a number of the streets, and there have been accidents um, at the corner of Mary and Little John. So I'm just wondering if there are any traffic conditions that would be implemented or um, if there would be any additional stop signs or stop lights um, that would be important to add in if, if Beta has any experience with that and uh, who would be responsible for the cost if it was determined that additional street signage would be implemented. Um, that's a very good question. Um, I don't know if Ms. Linema can address that question um, on behalf of the planning department. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I had to step away for just a second. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, the question is, um, if does, is anyone going to, as, if, if you don't mind my paraphrasing, um, is, is there any looking at whether additional uh, signage within the town owned streets, um, is there any investigation as to whether that would be either required or desired? And then if such, who would be paying for that? So signage is in like road signs? Yeah, so directional, directional signs. signs, restrictions and, and the like. I don't have an answer for that right now. I would need to consult with our transportation, our senior transportation planner. Okay, but there has, to, to your knowledge and, and certainly to my knowledge, there has been no investigation of that. Of no, that. not to my knowledge. Um, and my second comment about the traffic is that um, because the Hardy School lets out in the afternoon, there's actually a third uh, traffic jam in the middle of the afternoon between about two and three on Lake Street. And that's when many children are walking home. Some I've seen walking home by themselves. So an increase in traffic would be um, present, I think a danger for those children walking home during that in the afternoon as well. Um, and finally, I just want to express my disappointment about um, the bait and switch as has been used previously. 
um, about the parcel of land being donated by the owner, regardless of whether it is maintained for public use. I think just um, the fact that this has been a consistent um, behavior throughout the last few years, um, it's very disappointing now in the last minute having the owner uh, take back that parcel of land regardless of any conservation contingency. So I just wanna express that this is disturbing and I hope the ZBA takes that into consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, just a, a quick follow-up question. Um, I guess it could be to anyone in the neighborhood. Um, what is the start and close time for Hardy School? You know. It's um, 8.10 a.m. to 2.10 p.m. But then there are also uh, kids who are in the after school program and they're still around. And, and kids get in middle school and high school. Yeah. Great, thank you for that. Um, next on my list um, is uh, Helene Martel. Hi, um, I reside at 7 Osborne Road and I am on the corner or on one house down from Margaret Street. And then if you go one more block towards Thorndike Field, you have Edith, and then you're in the park, you're in the field, you're basically in the swamp. And we have had a big turnover of houses for sale recently, and we have a really large new crop of young kids. And um, they are enjoying their basketball hoops, you know, on Osborne Road. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to address, I guess, the um, E16, the construction um, work schedule. And just, we all know that this will just bring in the percentage of, of extra traffic. And um, also, so the traffic and the construction schedule, um, we all know the kids, if the ball goes rolling down to Margaret Street, eventually one of them is just gonna, you know, be at risk. Um, kids playing ball, it just happens. So I can't see having um, the construction work on Saturdays and Sundays. I just think that's anti-family and puts the kids at more risk. Um, we also know the kids are gonna suffer by having Thorndike playing field flood more. I, I'm not a um, hydro engineer, but um, this project, will result, I think, in less playing time for the teams down at Thorndike Field um, with all the um, re-navigation. And um, I don't know if it was brought up before, I, I guess I, I'm, last summer, we, uh, the area around here was just besieged by um, insects because of all the standing water in Thorndike Field. And I know it was a rainy summer all over, but the um, backyards could not be used. Um, just being outside often during the day um, was just not viable because of all the insects. I did call the Department of Public Health and they were aware of it. Mm -hmm. So again, um, we, we flood. <laughs> I've been here for 24 years. I got my pipes, I got my hoses. Um, we'll be flooding more and with more traffic. Um, I certainly, um, uh, just feel, um, well, I feel trepidation. So um, any way to limit this um, is, um, is what I'm um, uh, proposing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next on my list, uh, Mr. DiBiase. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Robert DiBiase, 29 Little John Street. We're basically the last house on the right at the entrance of what this proposed development is gonna be. So I guess I have five points to make. Um, I guess we'll start with, you know, before any construction starts in the day, we've heard the talk of people allowed to pull up ahead of time before the hours. Well, that's gonna bring in delivery trucks. If we're doing modules, you could find somebody camped out there at 5 a.m. with the truck running 
my bedroom's on the, sec on the second floor at the front of the house. I'm the first guy next to your development. I'm going to listen to that guy's engine running at 6 a.m. while he's waiting to unload. Uh, my concerns are the module units or whatever deliveries you have being camped out in front of my home that's going to restrict me from coming and going on a normal basis. This is a thickly settled district, a residential district that is not set up for this type of a development. I myself have been involved in developments of this side and magnitude in Cambridge, as well as in Boston. And um, quite frankly, I've seen modules come and go. I'm, I know what it's like. So it's not like you're, you're going to be telling me, oh, don't worry about it. I know where it is. I'm very much concerned about whether or not my family will be able to come and go on a regular basis during the day as people are camped out in front of my home on a regular basis. Um, mostly we're going to be looking at modules and if they're left here overnight, they shouldn't be, there should be no modules left in front of our home. Then I start to look at, you know, our traffic. I made a point a couple of weeks ago where I said, I have a nest camp set up outside. Anytime a car goes by, it automatically clocks them, knows what's come and gone. The average on a regular weekly day, daily basis in front of my home is about 50 to 60 cars on a weekend. It's 45. So take your number now of 412 and add that in. That magnitude is enormous. The impact. The number that you're using is filtering out to, to little, uh, rather, uh, Lake Street is basically being pyramided through as if you were sitting on Lake Street. You're not. You're all the way in. So the numbers increase at the furthest point and decrease as you leave the neighborhood because you're, now you're picking up more and more homes in the average. Lastly, my concern is days of work and work hours. We all, we're all used to 7.30 to 4.30, that's nothing new. But weekends, that's a big problem. Because as we said, this is very thickly settled district. This isn't your normal plop of building in the middle of a residential dwelling area. You're not on Mass Ave and you're not on a major thoroughway. Um, you know, when you look at E16 and 57, I think there's adjustments that have to be made to those. And, you know, as again, the burden, burden of traffic is going to be in front of my home. And I should not be restricted at any time of day coming and going from my own home, as well as my wife and children. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for taking the time to listen to me. And hopefully we can address these issues where they get handled properly. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Um, Stamps. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, and thanks so much to everybody on the ZBA. You, you people are in MCONCOM. Uh, you're, you're fabulous and the town is very, very lucky to have you. Um, I had just a couple of comments. Uh, Mr. Moore um, is on the tree committee and so am I. And I'm not sure I said my address, Susan Stamps, 39 Grafton Street. Um, I just wanted to be able to explain to people um, to what extent the developer will have to comply with the, with the bylaw as it was in 2016. Um, so I specifically wanted to ask, for example, um, because you said they are going to comply with the substance of the bylaws and you're not granting a waiver. So for example, would they have to submit a tree plan prior to work starting on the property? And under the 2016 version, the tree plan uh, would show all of the trees that were healthy and 10 inches in diameter in the setback of the property. And they would have to have present a plan showing those trees and what they plan to do with them, whether they want to leave them and they were going to take them down and um, have the tree warden look at it and approve that plan. And if they were going to take down trees, they had to pay, I think it was $500 per tree to the town or they could replant trees in their stead. And those were the specifics of the bylaw in 2016. And I was wondering if they're actually going to uh, follow that procedure. Um, Ms. Kiefer, can you address that? I believe it's waiver number 10. 
Yes, it is. Sorry about that. Um, so with respect to um, uh, presenting the tree plan, um, yes, we've agreed to that. The, the one um, difference um, that I believe that you mentioned is stamps that would, would not be is the, the need to get an approval. Um, that's because this is a master permit and it subsumes all of those, but um, the applicant has agreed that it would submit the, um, the, the plan in accordance with the requirements that were in effect at the time that the uh, comp permit application was submitted. Does that also mean, uh, Mr. Chair, that um, the applicant would not have to pay that fee or plants, specifically plant trees to replace the trees to be removed? How, how does that part of the bylaw work in this situation? So Ms. Kiefer, um, I believe that the, you know, we have a landscape plan from, from the applicant and that that would be what, what the final condition is um, in regards to disposition of trees. Um, that are existing on the land, um, but is the, I don't think we've really had a substantive discussion about the, the, the cost per tree for removal. Um, I, I believe that that was, um, it, it's not any tree on the property. So, um, and, and this stamps uh, outlined what, what they're, which trees are talking about. And it's, it's an either or. It's um, you could replant or or pay an amount for trees that are ten inch in diameter or greater within the defined areas. Oh, so the, okay. So, so the intention is that that once the uh, once the current tree plan has been submitted has been developed and submitted and we have the the final landscape plan that there will be a calculation of you know, which trees have have been replaced, and then what what replacement fees are still required? Is that your understanding? Uh, that that is, and in um, in case I'm misspeaking on behalf of the applicants, I'll I guess I will ask Art and Gwen to clarify that. But that was my understanding. On the stamps. Um, okay, I thought they were going to clarify that, but maybe they're not going to. Oh, actually, um, let me let me check because they they may be just on mute. I don't know. They they look like they kind of want to talk, but I'm not sure what they're doing. <laughs> she, in fact, I think I see Gwen talking. Okay, there we go. Hear her. We're, we're, we've lost our, our visual, but we um, we will comply with whatever the tree. Uh, ordinances, um, you know, saying um, we've been told, and you know that that so much is a, an, an invasive tree or, um, or shrubs and so on. So we don't we don't know how how a distinction is made between what is an invasive and being asked to be remo removed. Um, if that how that counts, but. Um, anyway, we, we, we'll, we'll comply. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Um, I have another couple of quick questions, Mr. Chair. Yes, Ms. Stamps. Okay. Um, in section F, F2, it says that the, um, the vendors will be required to use quote unquote smaller delivery vehicles. I, I don't know. Is that even enforceable? What, what does that mean, smaller compared to what? I'll find it. There we go. Um, so I think that the intent there is that the because of the the limited size of the access roads on the property that that large vehicles that are unable to navigate the property would not be brought onto the property. Oh, so. Actually, you mean small delivery vehicles, not smaller, probably. Yeah. Okay. I thought they, I just didn't know how you would define smaller. Smaller than what? A, right. You know, 14 wheeler, whatever. 
Okay. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, <clears throat> I think that Ms. Stamps makes a really good point there. Um, and there, I'm, I'm guessing that the applicant has an understanding about what a smaller vehicle delivery vehicle would be. And I think that we need to have something more precise or, or nobody will have a clue whether they're violating this or not. Um, so, you know, I, th I think the intent is to bring in things that minimize the disturbance in the neighborhood and some thought needs to be given to giving us advice as to where that line ought to be. Um, and I had two other two other points, Mr. Chair. Um, the uh, right under that F three, it says that there will be a jitney that will be available seven days a week um, to to drive people around um, and uh, to the the T and other quote unquote other local destinations. Um, number one, I didn't. Know we wanted to put in a time seven days a week, it could be only available from 12 to one, or, or it could be nine to five. It seems like maybe there ought to be some description of what the expectation is for when that's going to be available. And also, I didn't know if perhaps there would be something specific about they, it will go to a grocery store and it will go to a pharmacy because those are the two main places that people need on a regular basis. Okay. Um, certainly the discussions that have occurred today has definitely indicated that it would be going to, um, to include grocery shopping and pharmacy shopping and, and things along those lines. Um, our, but I, I would ask um, Art and Gwen if there's this if there are specific times that are being determined at this point or is that still undecided and up to the management company. It, it, it hasn't been determined by the management company, but we've been saying all along that we would be um, uh, offering the service at the times that would not be heavy traffic. Um, you know, the, 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 the rush hour or the, the, you know, the peak hour traffic times. And generally speaking, the times that are convenient for for most seniors would probably be between ten and I don't know two thirty or so. Um, so it, it, that's not something that we've determined, but it it, it will be it will be made in a the decision will be made in a logical way. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon, um, I just wanted to remind us that we're talking here not just about the residents, but we're also talking about staff and staff's hours are going to be skewed in such a way that they won't take place during uh, the peak hours necessarily, but they that means that people coming in to make breakfast are going to be coming in quite early and presumably, we hope, arriving at the tea station and are going to need a ride or at least some of them will. I mean, obviously, it is walking distances on a, on a nice day. Um, so I just encourage us that it isn't just residents and that a certain amount of, of being available during what may turn out to be peak hours or at least relatively high traffic hours are, are necessary. That's part of the, of the scheduling enterprise. Thank you. Um, and then finally, um, in uh, section I-21, um, I don't know much about fertilizer. It talks about slow release nitrogen fertilizer, but I do wonder if the board wants to require organic for fertilizer, i.e. not chemical fertilizer. I think that um, Arlington is a place where people generally think that, you know, native species, natural, you know, try not to use as many chemicals because we're in a dense area and it will get into the water. So I would ask the board to consider um, um, requiring organic. Maybe um, Ms. Um, Chapnick from the CONCOM 
would like to weigh in on that. And that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Chapnick? Um, obviously, um, organic, organic fertilizers are preferred. Um, the only reason we didn't put that in the special condition is it wasn't consistent with, with um, requirements that we've been um, asking of other projects and that were in our bylaws at the time of this project. But if the um, board wants to consider adding that as a requirement, um, we would definitely support it. Mr. Chairman, could I say, um, we will endeavor in every way to have this be uh, a, as environmentally responsible um, a project as, as can be. And uh, although Stephanie has refrained from saying anything about the management of the, our intended management of the conservation area, uh, we are. We have been in conversation with management people who are extraordinarily engaged in doing the right thing, and I won't say any more than that. But I, I, I can promise you that our intentions are that this will be an exemplary piece of property. Thank you. All right. Uh, and thank you, Ms. Stamps. Um, Mr. McKinnon? Yes, Matt McKinnon, 9 Little John Street. Yes, sir. So I'd like to apologize first for not being around when I had my hand raised earlier. Um, I was curious, uh, given the 40B, um, mm -hmm. let me reword this. I was curious uh, to, to read uh, all of the town officials that were against this development and whether those officials uh, should be noted in this draft document as being against the development. Um, whether the town officials for and against should be listed in the decision? Correct. Um, as a description of the application. Yeah, to some extent, it's not a it's not a vote tally, um, but you know, it, I I think we have noted in the decision that there you know it it, it certainly is controversial and um, you know not to so say controversial to is other yeah you know town officials. Okay. It's very easy to be opposed to a project that you don't have to put any skin in the game in terms of a decision. Right, of course. Um, so this is not a small project, as we all know. I, I believe it's a project that will kickstart a chain reaction of uh, infrastructural upgrades to compensate for a development that's much too large. Um, and will just trigger a grotesque upending of this community. Um, uh, I would like to urge the ZBA I would like to propose the ZBA to exclude uh, the four-story senior independent living facility from the de development, um, keeping with the 40B uh, recommendations on community size and density. Uh, you know, the, the two family townhouses are definitely similar in size and scope uh, of the largest homes in the existing neighborhood. Um, and I also think the ZBA should research the change in the conservation portion of the land and, and what that means to Arlington now and in the future. Um, as we've been well aware, uh, the applicant has, uh, has not been a good steward to the land at all. They were forced by the town of Arlington under a pressure of lawsuit uh, to clean up the land, which they, uh, they have done. Uh, within weeks of this public hearing. Um, so I don't think they should be allowed to continue to oversee its use in the future. I think it should be given to 
uh, the town or a re reputable uh, conservation commission. Uh, but I do not think the uh, uh, the applicant should be named as owner of, of this land. It's it's atrocious what they're trying to do to it now. And I, I fear what they would be doing it in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Rary. Hi, hey, it's uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think 50 years from now, um, people are going to um, look back and recognize that the outcome of uh, the conservation portion of this land and how it's stewarded, um, um, managed, um, um, improved over the next uh, decades is, is going to have more impact on the lives of people in the immediate neighborhood and, uh, and further, further out than will the, uh, the, the, the construction project itself. Uh, you know, after the, the many years of, of promising that the land would be given to the town, um, I would ask that the, um, that the board include in the findings, uh, I think it's fi finding 73, um, which, which right now is a recital of, of the um, applicant's position on, on how to handle the, the conservation land. Um, that, that that section should actually begin with a, a recital of the fact that, that for those many years, um, the, the donation of the land to the town was, was touted as an important factor in this, uh, in this project, um, including in the original application to, to mass housing. Um, and uh, the, uh, um, the, the idea of, um, it, I, I have to respond a little to what, what Ms. Noyes just said. Um, these folks may have the best of intentions, but um, a, a bunch of things are gonna happen. One is Oak Tree is gonna develop this, and then at some point it's gonna get flipped. And at some point it's gonna get flipped again, and at some point it's gonna get flipped again. So the owner of the, of the project um, many years from now um, is not going to be Gwen and Art who may be here with the best of intentions. Um, but somebody that we, you know, we have no way of knowing who it's going to be. Um, so the current um, uh, set of findings here, which is the applicant's uh, proposed way of, of, of going about um, protecting the land, um, is it sort of purports to be the, the outcome of an MOU. But just to be clear, there is no MOU yet because, because it hasn't been agreed to. Um, and I think that the, um, uh, the condition, which is, I think, condition M under, under C2, uh, uh, the condition requires that, that there be a successfully negotiated MOU. Um, I, I know that um, Ms. Kiefer pushed back on that a little earlier, um, but the board is going to need to come up with some way of <clears throat> incorporating that condition in order to give the parties a chance to really consider what's the best way to, to manage this. You are hearing uh, pushback. Um, I think you're gonna hear much more tremendous pushback at the idea of, of uh, uh, the, um, the applicant retaining ownership of the fee. If and nothing else, the, uh, that, that and, and Taking, taking that away from the town. The, the applicant's um, proposal appears to actually also rule out the town as the holder of a conservation restriction, um, which is um, something that absolutely has to be remain as a possibility for the outcome of a, of a negotiated MOU. So, my, my request to the board in this is to ensure that, um, that the continued uh, good faith negotiations around this can continue, that the possibilities 
for outcome of that include the fee being given to the town as originally promised, but also include the town being the, uh, the grantee of a conservation restriction. Um, because it is, if nothing else, it is, it is vital that the town have some property interest um, in this conservation land. Um, so uh, thank you for your, for your hard work and good night. It's awfully late. Um, thank you all for sticking it out. Thank you. Um, have uh, Ms. Keith Lucas for a second time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Heather Keith yes. Lucas, 10 Mott Street. Yes, please. Um, with respect to the existing conditions in open space in paragraph 37, there's been previous public comment on the neglect of the care for the property and the use of the phrase not in pristine condition, I feel minimizes the environmental and public health issues that exist on the property. Um, so I'd, I'd ask that the property also would be described a little bit more for the sanitation and public health safety issues that have existed. Um, and, and really, I'd, I'd ask for the consideration to clearly point out that the language spells out that it's the applicant who neglected the property as well. On multiple occasions, our neighbors have themselves volunteered to clean up the site at the town's coordination at the town's expense. And I recognize maybe the details of this may be outside of the scope or jurisdiction, if you will, of the ZBA, but I do believe that they're prudent to the characterization of the property in the impact the applicant has had in, in, in their neglect. And I do believe that it's relevant with respect to the change from the donation of the parcel to the town to beholder of that conservation parcel uh, to now being maintained by the applicant. Um, and, and to others' points, I, I do think that it is relevant that the town had to threaten a legal suit to the applicant for the current cleanup that began in September uh, as referenced in more details. I think that's in section 73B on page 21. Um, uh, in section 38, which is on page 12, which talks about the town and owner have taken action to rehouse and relocate the population. My understanding was that the applicant had not been engaged um, to assist in that effort, uh, though Arlington and the surrounding towns have supported their work on, on their own. Um, so I'm concerned that the characteristic also of if left unmanaged could also suggest that this development itself resolves the return of homeless encampment homelessness is a complicated public health matter and uh, the management of a property doesn't solve for this. I think it's misleading to suggest even inadvertently if, if that wasn't the intent that this development results in solving the encampments and homelessness. And so I just asked the ZBA to consider alternative wording here. Which paragraph was that in? Uh, sec uh, paragraph, uh, sorry, 38 on page 12. Sometimes it's the smallest sentences that cause the most problems. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you and the committee members um, and the consultants you've had during these hearings and thank you for your dedication. Well, thank you very much. It's very kind of you. Um, are there any further public comments? Once going twice. Close the public comment period. The public comment period for this hearing is now closed. Thank you all for your participation and sharing the knowledge of your neighborhood. Um, the resolution of this process has been made better and far better informed by, by everyone's participation. And I really appreciate everyone sticking with us through a very long night. Um, so the question before the board now uh, is do we have sufficient information to close the public hearing tonight 
and to move on to the deliberation phase of the comprehensive permit review. Um, so if we if we feel we're ready, then we can we can vote in the affirmative on that. Um, if not, we would need to uh, discuss the possibility of an extension and continuation with the with the applicant, which is something we had indicated at the prior hearing. We were going to try to avoid at all costs. Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. Hanlon, um, <clears throat> I've got a couple of questions that I'd like to ask uh, the applicant before we close it, but I'm I'm sort of we're now four minutes. We're now four hours and eight minutes into this meeting, so it already sort of counts as two hearings. Um, and I, I do think that we'll probably be able to. I mean, eventually we're going to have to call. It's going to the clock is going to expire. Um, but I'm interested in following up on what Mr. Rarick said. Um, if and I wonder if it, if my understanding is correct that if the town is not the grantee of the conservation restriction, the town has no say in what is in the conservation. Uh, that what is in the CR is that right? Um, is, Stephanie can answer this, but I'll I would might want to add something to it. But Stephanie, <laughs> oh, I. I was uh, I would I would respond that the uh, the applicant has um, offered to work um, with the town through the MOU process to um, identify kind of the um, the activities that would be allowed would not be allowed um, and so uh, whether or not it's the town that becomes the holder of the restriction um, there there's there's and, and there always has been a willingness of the applicant to work with the town to um, work towards what would be allowed within the area and what would not be allowed within the area. If if uh, it became necessary to enforce the terms of the restriction, would the town be entitled to do that as some sort of a third party beneficiary? Um, Paul, perhaps you can weigh in, but on the traditional CR that it, the municipality also signs it, I believe, isn't that correct? We have this state and then the, uh, it would go before I, the. I don't think the municipality signs it unless they're a party. Unless they're it. a party. Yeah, if it's a third party that's holding the CR, then they would be the signatory to it. Generally speaking, Patrick, you're correct. If the town is not a party to the conservation restriction, it's not gonna have any rights to enforce it. However, that is something that could be covered in the MOU. Um, and I guess the shifting gears a little bit, I'm wondering, I, I think as you've heard tonight, the community, and it's not just the people who are here too, if you've been sort of watching the, the blaze on the internet today, um, are very concerned just because of all the distrust that's built up over the years, if nothing else, are very concerned with the prospect of the owner retaining the ownership of uh, the fee interest in the open space parcel um, after so many years in which that has not been thought of, uh, at least publicly, as, as an option. Um, and par part of the problem there is a suspicion that somehow notwithstanding these other documents, most of which have not been concluded, somehow it's the preservation of that parcel and its management in an appropriate way um, isn't really guaranteed because ultimately the owner has the ability to do something. And we don't know exactly what it is, uh, but surely he wants to keep the fee interest for some reason. And I guess I'd like to understand what it is that that reason is uh, and to what extent it really is, is necessary or advisable to, uh, for the, the owner to, to retain ownership. Obviously he can, uh, I mean, it's up to him whether to grant the, what, how to handle that parcel uh, up to a point, but I'm, I'm wondering sort of what, what the reasons is. What are the, what are the, what are the sticks he's holding on to in this bundle of sticks that is important to him and that gives him, gives that, gives that value to him? Uh, because we need to know that in order to have some sense of, 
of what the significance is of, uh, of, of changing course now after so long. Sure. Um, through the chairman, um, Mr. Hanlon, the, uh, your, your question is, uh, it, it's an understandable question. Um, and I, I think we've discussed this to some degree in prior hearings, but um, the, the conservation parcel is, is really like the, the front door, the front yard of the independent living. And so the owner does have an interest that that it be maintained and that it's um, you know coextensive with you know the views from the residents of the independent living building. And I think that that's a, an important factor. Um, and so you know, yes, it's not a development stick that the owner is proposing to hold on to and and you know obviously through the conservation restriction, the, the rights to develop, those are given up, but it's, it's the, it is so part and parcel of like what the look of the independent living is that it's, they find that it's important to, to keep that. Um, and with respect to um, kind of what other factors go into this, and I know that um, some of the, like the, the work sessions that have gone on with the town that obviously it wasn't within the ZBA process, um, but there was also hesitancy by the town to um, to acquire the property, and, and they were they didn't seem to want to have to have it within those initial discussions. And I think that the town wasn't certain exactly, um, and and I think that the applicant in working through, you know, well, what should I do? Should I donate it to a third party? Should I, and then it came to the realization that it just made sense for the continuity of the, uh, the independent living to like, to make certain that it looks nice, um, that it's that front lawn to that property. Um, I, I... Let me just uh, add a bit to that. Uh, we discussed that internally a fair amount. And I, I think that um, there were two things. Number one, <clears throat> the, uh, the opinion was on, on our side that the town was reluctant to take title to it for years. For years, and we, you know, we always intended to give it away one way or the other. But I think what emerged is um, the value of marketing uh, the independent living facility to a third party. We want to get the ideal, uh, the, the best possible person in to to develop that uh, property as an independent living facility. This is a real skill. And uh, we've actually owned one, uh, not quite the same format, but we know what, what a skillful organization can do and what a, an organization that not, is not so skillful. And the feeling was that the, it would be extremely important in, in marketing that project, uh, as Stephanie was just saying, to control what the front yard is. In other words, trusting, uh, you know, you know this, the, the town may have the very best of intentions, but uh, there's nothing like self-interest to, to really get out there and make that a wonderful, wonderful place. And I think part of being wonderful, and Gwen and I both are very strong in that, is having public use. You know, what'll be, uh, the front yard should be something that uh, is a real amenity for the people that live there. They're seeing activity, they're seeing kids, they're seeing, uh, you know, whatever transpires, boardwalks. And as Gwen mentioned, we've talked to people that might take that over that would be, uh, you know, the right kind. In fact, people that have worked with people in Arlington, where I got, for whatever reason, not disclosing that right now, but these are, uh, we've worked on that to get the right thing to happen there. Uh, and it, it really does have to do with the uh, creating an amenity for that uh, independent living facility and controlling it so that it's it's uh, coordinated and integrated. I, I, I have to add that I, I, the concern that's being expressed is very well deserved and, and that the, the opportunity to do something that is above and beyond what people are thinking could happen, I think is there. And, and I, I, in all honesty, this last two or three weeks 
<laughs> has has been the first time that there has been an ex, you know a real expression of 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 interest in, from you know the, the, the town should acquire and manage that property for years we've talked about about that being a possibility and the the the, the feedback has been going from lukewarm to negative about that so um, I'm 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 really kind of uh, uh, taken aback by the notion that we have changed our mind. I have been talking with a number of en entities about the possibility of, of of managing that property in a in a very respectful and town um, uh, considering way that, that for the public benefit, and that's still the the track we're on from an environmental, from a social and from a, a, a conservation standpoint. So I, I, I just, I'm being a little bit defensive about this because we've, we've worked hard on this and we're not going to disappoint you. Mr. I Chairman. I step in for a, a second here. So it's 10 minutes to midnight. <laughs> um, I do want to confirm with Paul. Um, so we are legally <laughs> required to close the public hearing. Um, and the date for that is October 21st. Does that mean we have to close it before October 21st or can we close it on October 21st? No, we, we were extended to October 21st. So, so if we go past midnight, it doesn't mean that we're missed our deadline. Okay. Um, Mr. Not that Chairman, I'm encouraging you to go past midnight. Right. This, Mr. This Chairman, I have just one more. Valid only until 1230. So just to I keep see. that in mind. Mr. Hanlon. Well, I just wanted to, it's, it's obvious that there are some interests that are involved here and I'm, I would like to encourage, there's no way, the, the ZBA is obviously not going to negotiate anything with the applicant or anything else. That's not our job. Uh, and we're going to go into, into uh, uh, a session where we have to pretend that we don't know anything more uh, in, a pre, that in pretty quickly. Uh, I, Keeping the, keeping the fee interest is keeping a black box. Nobody knows exactly which bundles, which sticks are in there. And I think that it maximizes the degree of distrust, at least on the part of residents of Arlington and, and maybe others for the sort of the residual interest that everything that isn't already dealt with is going is mine uh, to result in the owner. I understand what, Gwen and Art have, uh, say about, about that. And I just want to encourage them as they discuss this with the town and encourage the town as they discuss this with uh, the applicant uh, that they find a way of accommodating these interests of making sure that the front yard of the building is meets the standards and that the appropriate control is given over the management of the facility to make that happen. Um, but to think that that ultimately an acceptable, it is far more acceptable for the fee to go to somebody else who can who can hold it so that there are no surprises uh, when you consult brilliant lawyers like Stephanie down the road and suddenly they they think of something that we didn't think of because we're not smart enough yet to do that. Um, so, I mean, the, the private ordering is private ordering. There's lots and lots of ways of doing it, and I'm sure that you've been thinking about it. I just like to plant the idea that it's not an easy thing to handle it by reserving the fee, that that makes that maximizes the amount of distrust and makes everything a lot harder. And I'm sort of hoping that when there's a set of legal arrangements that manage how this works, um, something that we won't be a part of, that we're able to, that, but that will eventually probably to control, uh, that you've seriously considered the implications of continuing on the path that you're on. Mr. Chair. Mr. Revelak. Uh, I just want to follow up a little bit on that discussion. Um, in my recollection, uh, there has been hesitancy on the town's behalf when it come when it's you know the idea of uh, the town taking ownership of this property has come up. Uh, I think Mr. Chapdelaine's um, letter to the board that's included on the agenda materials for this week is just the most recent example. Um, now, as a board, we cannot acquire or hold property. Uh, that's something only town meeting can do, and we cannot obligate town meeting or the 
we, we can't obligate any entity in the town to take ownership of the property. So, I mean, one thing I just would like to mention for the folks who are still with us is that it is entirely possible that, um, you know, we can't, even if the applicants wanted to give the property to the town, there is no uh, guarantee that the town would ultimately accept it. And in our decision, we are just going to have to, you know, accommodate an either or. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman Klein, may I comment briefly? This is Susan Chapnick. Um, yes, please. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, actually, I actually disagree um, that the town showed extreme reluctance. Um, if you read the memo from Adam Chapdelaine in summary, it's talking about the reluctance of accepting a parcel that may have significant contamination and that the town then would have to um, put up, you know, funds or, or uh, clean it up or help clean it up. That's the issue there. It wasn't that the town was reluctant to accept it. The town is reluctant to accept a parcel that they don't know what's on it. So in conclusion to that letter, Adam Chapdelaine said, if a transfer of land were contemplated by the ZBA as a condition of the 40B permit, a memorandum of understanding with detailed timelines and provisions to achieve the foregoing, meaning cleanup and understanding that it wasn't a hazardous waste site would, need, would be necessary. So the town did not say they would not accept the property. The town put conditions on the acceptance of the property. I will also remind um, the ZBA when you're deliberating to look at other conservation restrictions that we have in the town. And um, if you need to look at them, um, they're in, in town uh, documents. We have a conservation restriction on Elizabeth Island. We have a conservation restriction on Sims, and I believe there's one other small one. So um, I maintain that this, this, this change from the um, applicant um, proposing to keep the property rather than transferring it to the town is, is not necessarily, it's not in the town's interest. I will also just make one more statement that a conservation area is not first and foremost a public amenity. That is not what a conservation area is. If this is supposed to be a nice entrance or a nice lawn, that is not a conservation area. A conservation restriction saves a resource for the environment, for wildlife habitat, for wetland, to allow it to flood so it holds flood water. It is not first and foremost a public amenity. That doesn't mean there can't be some boardwalks, et cetera, but that is not the purpose of a conservation restriction. And finally, I will just end with a formal conservation restriction must be approved by the state. So the state would have to approve that this would be a conservation restriction. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, so given the, is there any? I'd like to just add, add one more thing. I, I'm probably repeating myself a little bit. Um, as far as the value, I mean, there's no development value anymore in the parcel. So there's no economic reason other than how that parcel relates to the actual senior living facility. And that creates some self-interest. I think that we'll police that property, make it uh, viable, work on it. There'll be money supplied to do things. There'll be, uh, uh, we thought about some kind of a, uh, a, a <clears throat> space inside our building to uh, have equipment to help uh, sustain it. I, I really think it's in the, in the town's best interest 
to have it done this way. And, uh, and what would happen, I think, if we started doing it the other way, I think, <laughs> as you know, the Gwen and I are development agents here. We're, we're not the owner, we're the applicant. And um, I certainly know that the, the I think the um, owner of the land would not be particularly adverse to uh, giving it away because that's how we started this whole thing. Uh, thinking that we'd give it away and then we met resistance, whatever is said, there, there were a lot of reasons that we were not going there. But I think then we'd have to start <laughs> saying, well, we'll give you the land, but by the way, we want you to do blah, 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 so our front yard is protected. And that's that shouldn't have to be done, you know? I mean, we, we will do that just out of self-interest. Whoever owns the uh, senior living facility would just have self-interest in doing that. Where if, we, if somebody else has control of it, i.e. the town, and we give it away, I think that we'd start to have to haggle about, well, you know, we'll clean it up to some, you know, in the MOU, we're talking about a lot of things that we do, and we're willing to do whatever we want in the MOU. You know, we've been very cooperative in that. Anyhow, it's it's not an easy one. I understand that. And it's maybe it's always better to own something than to not own it. I don't know. But um, I, I really think that uh, we're going to bring, it's particularly Gwen, a lot of energy uh, to making that a great place. Okay. Um, so unless there's objection, I'm going to close discussion. Um, so we because we, we do need to move on to the vote here and make sure we get all our, it's not our intention. Thank T's crossed and I's dotted before we, uh, we, we run out of time here. Um, I thought you could say that. So with that. Um, I asked you to say it. But, I mean, that's the, the, the intention. Is so as a board, is there anyone who feels that we need to, that we need an extension of time? I think lots of shaking heads. Um, so with that in mind, um, may I have a motion to close the public hearing for Thorndike Place? Mr. Chairman. Anlin. This is my favorite part of the whole evening. I move that we close the public hearing in the Thorndike case. Thank you. Second. Tim. Thank you, Mr. Revelak. A vote of the board. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. O'Rourke. Mr. O'Rourke. Aye. Aye. See you there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Revelak. Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. And the chair votes aye. The public hearing for Thorndike Place is now closed. Um, so now the board has 40 days to deliberate and finalize its decision. Um, under state law, the board is no longer allowed to receive commentary or testimony and must rely on the extensive record amassed over the last five years. Uh, deliberative sessions are held in public, but will only include members of the board and our legal consultant. Um, so we have a date scheduled to uh, our first deliberative meeting uh, we had set at the previous hearing uh, will be Thursday, October 28th at 7.30 p.m. Um, And so uh, just briefly going down the, so the upcoming schedule, um, we do have a regular set of hearings scheduled for uh, Tuesday, October 26th. I believe we have two continuances and three new cases on that evening. I can't recall specifically. Um, and we also have some uh, decisions to approve and I believe some minutes to approve at that hearing as well. And as I just said, Thursday, October 28th at 7.30 PM is the first deliberation session for the decision on Thorndike Place. Um, and we have um, discussed at the previous hearing that we are going to try um, and make sure that the final vote um, on the final decision take place no later than Tuesday, November 23rd, um, which is well within the, the 40 day period. So any questions about that schedule? Hearing none. 
Thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout this very long meeting. Um, especially we wish to thank Rick Valorelli, Vincent Lee, Kelly Linema, and everyone else who has put in time putting together materials for us or scheduling these meetings or helping to run these meetings or anything else. Um, this is you know, really a, a full town effort to support the ZBA and it is greatly appreciated. Um, Please note the purpose of the board's recording this meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It's our understanding the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.parlington.us. That email address is also listed on the ZBA's website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. No move, Mr. Hanlon. Second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Uh, vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. O'Rourke. Aye. Mr. Revelack. Aye. Mr. Ford. Aye. The chair votes aye. The board is adjourned. Thank you all very, very much. Mr. Night, Chairman. Guys. Everything Good night, everybody. Good night. Good morning. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Ooh, good morning. You realize this gives us another day on our 40 days. <laughs> <laughs> yes, tricky. 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 Good night, all. Good night, all. Take night care. Off.